Chapter Fifty Seven of A Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter Fifty Seven. Ross discovers the North Magnetic Pole. The first attempt to discover the Northwest Passage by means of steam, instead of sail, was made by Captain Ross, who since his expedition in 1819 had been burning to set off again for the Arctic regions. The reward of twenty thousand pounds held out to the discoverer of a northwest passage had been repealed, but an old friend, Felix Booth, decided to finance Ross, the government having refused. After examining various steamships advertised for sale, says Ross, I purchased the Victory, which had been once employed as a packet. With food and fuel for one thousand days, and accompanied by his nephew, James Ross, who had been with Perry on his recent polar voyage, he left England the end of May, 1829, not to return for many a long year. Disasters soon began. The victory began to leak, her engines were defective, and there was nothing for it but to heave up her paddles and trust to sail. Sailing to the northward, they found the sea smooth, and the weather so warm that they could dine without a fire and with the skylights off. Entering Lancaster Sound, they sailed up Prince Regent's Inlet. They soon discovered the spot where the fury had been wrecked four years before, and abandoned by Captain Perry, with whom was James Ross, who now found the stores which had been safely hidden on that occasion. As they made their way up the inlet, strong currents and vast masses of ice, hard and solid as granite, more than once threatened them with destruction. Imagine, says Captain Ross, these mountains, hurled through a narrow strait by a rapid tide, meeting with the noise of thunder, breaking from each other's precipices huge fragments, till, losing their former equilibrium, they fall over headlong, lifting the sea around in breakers and whirling it in eddies. Escaping these perils, Ross entered a fine harbor. Here he landed, hoisted the colors, and took possession of the new land he had found, and drinking the king's health, called the land Boothia after his patron. For the next two months, August and September, he carefully explored the coast of this newly discovered Boothia for some three hundred miles, naming points and capes and islands after friends at home and on board. Heavy squalls of snow and ever-sickening ice pointed out the necessity of winter quarters, and first October found the victory imprisoned by thick, immovable ice. The prison door was shut upon us for the first time, says Ross sadly. Nothing was to be seen but one dazzling, monotonous extent of snow. It was indeed a dull prospect. Amid all its brilliancy, this land of ice and snow has ever been, and ever will be, a dull, dreary, heart-sinking, monotonous waste, under the influence of which the very mind is paralyzed. Nothing moves and nothing changes, but all is forever the same, cheerless, cold, and still. The explorers little thought that this was to be their home for the next three years. They spent a fairly cheerful Christmas with mince pies and iced cherry brandy taken from the stores of the Fury. And early in 1830 the monotony was broken by the appearance of Eskimos. These were tremendously dressed up in furs, a shapeless mass, and Ross describes one as resembling the figure of a globe standing on two pins. They soon became friendly, taking the Englishmen to see their snow huts, drawing them charts of Boothia Gulf beyond Felix Harbor, while in exchange the explorers taught English to the little Eskimo children and ministered to their ailments. The ship's carpenter, even making a wooden leg for one of the natives. 
so the long winter passed away. A few land journeys with sledges only ended in disappointment. But at last the vessel was free from ice, and joyfully they hoisted their sails. But worse disappointment was in store. She had sailed for three miles when they met a ridge of ice, and a solid sea forbade any further advance. In vain did they try to saw through the ice. November found the poor victory, hopelessly ice-bound, and her crew doomed to another winter in the same region. It was not till May that a journey across the land of Boothia to the west coast was possible. Ross and his nephew had been calculating the position of the North Magnetic Pole all the long winter, and with signs of spring they set forth. Our journey had a very new appearance. The mother of two Eskimos led the way with a staff in her hand, my sledge following with the dogs, and one of the children, guided by one of the wives with a child on her back. After a native sledge came that of Commander Ross, followed by more Eskimos. Many halts were made, as our burdens were heavy, the snow deep, and the ice rough. After a fortnight's travelling, past the chain of great lakes, the woman still guiding them. The Rosses, uncle and nephew, separated. James Ross now made for the spot where the magnetic pole was supposed to be. His own account shows with what enthusiasm he found it. We were now within fourteen miles of the calculated position of the magnetic pole, and now commenced a rapid march, and persevering with all our might, we reached the calculated place at eight in the morning, on the first of June. I must leave it to others to imagine the elation of mind with which we found ourselves now, at length arrived at this great object of our ambition. It almost seemed as if we had accomplished everything that we had come so far to see and to do, as if our voyage and all its labors were at the end, and that nothing remained for us but to return home and be happy for the rest of our days. Amid mutual congratulations, we fixed the British flag on the spot, and took possession of the North Magnetic Pole and its adjoining territory in the name of Great Britain and King William the Fourth. We had plenty of materials for building, and we therefore erected a cairn of some magnitude, under which we buried a canister containing a record of the interesting fact. Another fortnight found the successful explorers staggering back to the victory, with their great news after an absence of twenty-eight days. Science has shown that the magnetic pole revolves, and the dross cairn will not again mark its exact position for many a long year to come. By the end of August the ice had broken, and the victory was once more in full sail, but the gales of wind drove her into harbor, which she never left again. Despite their colossal efforts, it soon became apparent that yet another winter would have to be passed in the frozen seas. The entries in Ross's journal became shorter and more despondent day by day. The sight of ice to us is a plague, a vexation, a torment, an evil, a matter of despair. Could we have skated, it would not have been an amusement. We had exercise enough, and, worst of all, the ice which surrounds us, obstructed us, imprisoned us, annoyed us in every possible manner, had become odious to our sight. By October there was no open water to be seen. The hopeful did not hope more, and the despondent continued to despair. This was their third winter in the ice. Food was growing scarce. The meat was so hard frozen that it had to be cut with a saw and saved in warm cacao. Snow blindness afflicted many of the men badly. At last came the summer of 1833, but the victory was still fast in her winter quarters, and all attempts to release her had failed. They now decided to abandon her, and to drag their boats over the ice to the wreck of the fury, 
replenishing their stores and trusting to some whaler to take them home. We get a pathetic picture. The collars were hoisted, says Ross, and nailed to the mast. We drank a parting glass to our poor old ship, and having seen every man out, I took my own adieu of the victory in the evening. She had deserved a better fate. It was like parting with an old friend. On 23rd of April, the weary explorers began dragging their boats and the last month's provisions over the ice in the face of wind and snow. The journey was painful and distressing. They found Barrow Strait full of impenetrable ice, and resolved to pass the winter on Fury Beach, which seemed almost like home to the half-starved men. Erecting a house, which they called Somerset House, they prepared for a fourth winter. For severity it was unequaled, the crew developed scurvy, and all were suffering sorely when, in the following August, the unfortunate party was rescued by the whaler, Isabella of Hull, once commanded by Captain Ross. It was the ship in which Ross had made his first Arctic exploration. At first the mate refused to believe the story of these bear-like men. The explorers and Ross had been lost these two years. But almost frantic with delight, the explorers climbed on board the Isabella to be received with the heartiest of cheers when their identity was disclosed. That we were a repulsive-looking people, none could doubt, says poor Ross. Unshaven, since I know not when, dirty, dressed in rags of wild beasts, and starved to the very bones, our gaunt and grim looks, when contrasted with those of the well-dressed and well-fed men around us, made us all feel what we really were, as well as what we seemed to others. Then followed a wild scene of washing, dressing, shaving, eating, all intermingled, while in the midst of all there were questions to be asked and news from England to be heard. Long accustomed to a cold bed on the hard snow or the bare rock, Few of them could sleep that night, in the comfort of the new accommodation. They were soon safely back in England, large crowds collecting to get a glimpse of Captain Ross. His own words best end the account of his travels. On my arrival in London, he says, on the 20th of October, 1833, it became my first duty to repair to the royal palace of Windsor, with an account of my voyage, and to lay at the feet of His Majesty the British flag which had been hoisted on the magnetic pole. End of chapter 57For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 58 Flinders Names Australia We must now return to Australia, as yet so imperfectly explored, and take up the story of the young colony at Sydney. For seven years it thrived under the careful management of Governor Phillips, who was then replaced by one hunter. With the new governor from England arrived two young men destined to distinguish themselves in the exploration of New South Wales. They were midshipmen Matthew Flinders and Surgeon George Bass. The reading of Robinson Crusoe had created in young Flinders a passion for sea adventure, and no sooner had the Reliance anchored in Sydney harbour then the two young friends resolved on an exploring expedition to the south. For there were rumors afloat that Van Diemen's land did not join the main continent of New South Wales. Little enough help was forthcoming for the expedition, and the friends had to content themselves with a little boat eight feet long, the Tom Thumb, and only a boy to help them. But with all the eager enthusiasm of youth, they sailed from Port Jackson 
on 25th of March, 1796. It is impossible to follow all their adventures as they attempted to survey the coast. A storm on the 29th nearly swallowed up the little Tom Thumb and her plucky sailors. At ten o'clock, says Flinders, the wind, which had been unsettled and driving electric clouds in all directions, burst out in a gale. In a few minutes the waves began to break, and the extreme danger to which this exposed our little bark was increased by the darkness of the night and the uncertainty of finding any place of shelter. Mr. Boss kept the sheet of the sail in his hand, drawing in a few inches occasionally, when he saw a particularly heavy sea following. I was steering with an oar. A single wrong movement or a moment's inattention would have sent us to the bottom. After running near an hour in this critical manner, some huge breakers were distinguished ahead. It was necessary to determine what was to be done at once, for our bark could not live ten minutes longer. On coming to what appeared to be the extremity of the breakers, the boat's head was brought to the wind, the mast and sail taken down, and the oars taken out. Pulling then towards the reef, during the intervals of the heaviest seas, in three minutes we were in smooth water. A nearer approach showed us the beach of a well-sheltered cove, in which we anchored for the rest of the night. We thought Providential Cove, a well-adapted name for the place. Important local discoveries were made by the young explorers, and their skill and courage earned for them a better equipment for further exploration. A whale-boat, provisioned for six weeks, and a crew of six, were placed at the disposal of Bass, in order that he might discover whether Van Diemen's land was joined to the mainland, or whether there was a strait between. Cook had declared that there was no strait. Flinders now tells the story of his friend's triumphant success in finding the straits that now bear his name. He tells how Bass found the coast turning westward, exposed to the billows of a great ocean, of the low sandy shore, of the spacious harbor, which from its relative position to the hitherto known parts of the coasts was called Port Western. His provisions were now at the end, and though he was keen to make a survey of his new discovery, he was obliged to return. This voyage of six hundred miles in an open boat on dangerous and unknown shores is one of the most remarkable on record. It added another three hundred miles of known coastline, and showed that the shores of New Holland were divided from Van Diemen's land. So highly did the colonists appreciate this voyage of discovery, that the whaleboat in which Bass sailed was long preserved as a curiosity. A small boat of twenty-five tons, provisioned for twelve weeks, was now put at the disposal of the two friends, Flinders and Bass, to complete the survey of Van Diemen's land, and in October 1798 they sailed for the south. With gales and strong winds blowing across the channel, now known as Bass Strait, they made their way along the coast, the northern shores of Van Diemen's Land, till they found a wide inlet. Here they found a quantity of black swans, which they ate with joy, and also kangaroos, mussels, and oysters. This inlet they called Port Dalrymple, after the lead hydrographer to the Admiralty in England. On 9th December, still coasting onward, they passed Three Hammock Island, and then a whole cluster of islands, to which, in honor of His Excellency the Governor of New South Wales, I gave the title of Hunter's Isles. And now a long swell was noticed from the southwest. It broke heavily upon a small reef and upon all the western shores, but although it was likely to prove troublesome and perhaps dangerous, Mr. Bass and myself hailed it with joy and mutual congratulation as announcing the completion of our long-wished-for discovery of a passage into the southern Indian Ocean, calling the point where the island coast turned Cape Grim 
they sailed along the western shores, their little boat exposed to the swell of the southern ocean. Sailing joyfully from point to point, and naming them at will, the two explorers reached the extreme west, which they called Southwest Cape. This had been already sighted by one of Cook's party in 1773. South Cape and Tasman's Head had been likewise charted as points at the extreme south of New South Wales. So the explorers sailed right round the island, on which Tasman had landed 156 years before, and after an absence of five months they reached Sydney with their important news. Bass now disappears from the annals of exploration, but his friend Flinders went off to England, and found in our old friend Banks a powerful friend. He was given a stout North Country ship, His Majesty's Ship Investigator, of 334 tons, with orders to return to New Holland and make a complete survey of the coast, and was off again in July 1801, with young John Franklin, his nephew, aboard. The investigator arrived at Cape Leuven in December, and anchored in King George Sound, discovered by Vancouver some ten years before. By the new year he was ready to begin his great voyage round the Terra Australis, as the new country was still called. Indeed, it was Flinders who suggested the name of Australia, for the tract of land, hitherto called New Holland. His voyage can easily be traced on our maps today. Voyaging westward through the recherches group of islands, Flinders passed the low, sandy shore to a cape he named Cape Pusley, after his late admiral. High, bleak cliffs now rose to the height of some five hundred feet for a distance of four hundred and fifty miles, the great Australian bight. Young Franklin's name was given to one island, investigator to another. Cape Catastrophe commemorated a melancholy accident and the drowning of several of the crew. Kangaroo Island speaks for itself. Here they killed thirty-one dark brown kangaroos. The whole ship's company was employed this afternoon, skinning and cleaning the kangaroos, and the delightful regale they afforded after four months' privation from almost any fresh provisions. Half a hundred weight of heads, four quarters, and tails were stewed down into soup for dinner, and as much steaks given to both officers and men as they could consume by day and night. In April 1802 a strange encounter took place, when suddenly there appeared a heavy-looking ship without any top-gallant masts up, showing a French ensign. Flinders cleared his decks for action in case of attack, but the strangers turned out to be the French ship Le Geographe, which, in company with the Le Naturaliste, had left France, 1800, for exploration of the Australian coasts. Now it was well known that Napoleon had cast longing eyes upon the Terra Australis. Indeed, it is said that he took with him to Egypt a copy of Cook's Voyages. Flinders, too, knew of this French expedition, but he was not specially pleased to find French explorers engaged on the same work as himself. The commanders met as friends, and Baudin, the French explorer, told how he had landed also near Cape Leuven in May 1801, how he had given the names of his two ships to Cape Naturalist and Geograph Bay and was now making his way round the coast. Flinders little guessed at this time that the French were going to claim the south of New South Wales as French territory under the name of Terra Napoleon, though it was common knowledge that this discovery was made by Englishmen. Ah, Captain, said one of the French crew to Flinders, if we had not been kept so long picking up shells and catching butterflies, at Van Diemen's land. You would not have discovered this coast before us. When Bowden put in at Port Jackson a couple of months later, he inquired of the governor the extent of British claims in the Pacific. 
The whole of Tasmania and Australia are British territory, was the firm answer. After this encounter, Flinders discovered and named Port Philip, at the head of which stands the famous city of Melbourne today, and then made his way on to Port Jackson. He had managed his crews so well that the inhabitants of Port Jackson declared they were reminded of England by the fresh color of the men amongst the investigator ship's company. The Frenchmen had not fared so well. One hundred and fifty out of one hundred and seventy were down, with scurvy, and had to be taken to the hospital at Sydney. Before the end of July, Flinders was off again, sailing northwards along the eastern coast of New South Wales. October found him passing the Great Barrier Reefs, and on the 21st he had reached the northernmost point, Cape York. Three days of anxious steering took the investigator through Torres Strait, and Flinders was soon sailing into the great gulf of Carpentaria. Still hugging the coast, he discovered a group of islands to the south of the gulf, which he named the Wellesley Islands after General Wellesley, afterward Duke of Wellington. Here he found a wealth of vegetation, cabbage palm was abundant, nutmegs plentiful, and a sort of sandalwood was growing freely. He spent one hundred and five days exploring the gulf. Then he continued his voyage round the west coast, and back to Port Jackson by the south. He returned after a year's absence, with a sickly crew and a rotten ship. Indeed, the investigator was incapable of further service, and Flinders decided to go back to England for another ship. As passenger on board the Porpoise, early in August 1802, he sailed from Sydney for the Torres Strait, accompanied by two returning transports. All went well for the first four days, and they had reached a spot on the coast of Queensland, when a cry of breakers ahead fell on the evening air. In another moment the ship was carried amongst the breakers and struck upon a coral reef. So sudden was the disaster that there was no time to warn the other ships closely following. As the porpoise rolled over on her beam ends, huge seas swept over her, and the white foam leaped high. Then the mast snapped, water rushed in, and soon the porpoise was a hopeless wreck. A few minutes later, one of the transports struck the coral reef. She fell on her side, her deck facing the sweeping rollers, and was completely wrecked. The other transport escaped, sailed right away from the scene of disaster, and was never seen again by the crew of the porpoise. The dawn of day showed the shipwrecked crew a sandbank, to which some ninety-four men made their way, and soon set sail-close tents on the barren shore. They had saved enough food for three months. Flinders, as usual, was the moving spirit. A fortnight later, in one of the ship's boats, with twelve rowers and food for three weeks, he left Wreck Reef amid ringing cheers to get help from Sydney for the eighty men left on the sandbank. The reader, says the hero of this adventure, has perhaps never gone two hundred and fifty leagues at sea in an open boat or along a strange coast inhabited by savages. But if he recollect the eighty officers and men upon Wreck Reef, and how important was our arrival to their safety, and to the saving of the charts, journals, and papers of the investigator's voyage, he may have some idea of the pleasure we felt, particularly myself, at entering our destined port. Half-starved, unshaven, deplorable indeed were the men when they staggered into Sydney, and an involuntary tear started from the eye of friendship and compassion, when the governor learned how nearly Flinders and his friends had lost their lives. A few days later Flinders left Sydney for the last time, in a little home-built ship of twenty-nine tons, the Cumberland. It was the first ship ever built in the colony, and the colonists were glad it should be of use to the men who had done so much for their country. With all his papers and his beloved journals, Flinders put to sea 
accompanied by a ship, to rescue the men left on Brekreef. Three months later, owing to the leaky condition of the ship, he landed at Mauritius. Here he was taken prisoner, and all his papers and journals were seized by the French. During his imprisonment, a French voyage of discovery was issued, Napoleon himself paying a sum of money to hasten publication. All the places discovered by Flinders, or Monsieur Flinador, as the French called him, were called by French names. Fortunately, before reaching Mauritius, Flinders had sent duplicate copies of his charts home, and the whole fraud was exposed. Flinders did not reach home till 1810. A last tragedy awaited him, for he died in 1814, on the very day that his great book, The Voyage to Terra Australis, was published. Flinders was a true explorer, and as he lay dying he cried, I know that in future days of exploration my spirit will rise from the dead and follow the exploring ship. End of chapter 58「Much discovery had been done in the great new island, continent of Australia. The Blue Mountains had been crossed, and the river Macquarie discovered and named after the governor of that name. But Sturt's famous discovery of the river Darling and his descent of the Murray River rank amongst the most noteworthy of a bewildering number of lesser expeditions. Captain Sturt landed with his regiment, the 39th, at Sydney, in the year 1827, to guard the convicts. His first impressions of Sydney are interesting. Cornfield and orchard, he says, have supplanted wild grass and brush. On the ruins of the forest stands a flourishing town, and the stillness of that once desert shore is now broken by the buckle and by the busy hum of commerce. It is not unusual to see from thirty to forty vessels from every quarter of the globe, riding at anchor at one time. Sir Dolph Darling, governor of New South Wales, soon formed a high opinion of Sturt's ability, and when an expedition was proposed into the interior for further exploration, he appointed him leader. There was a universal opinion in the colony that in the middle of the unknown continent lay a large inland sea, Oxley had made his way to a shallow ocean of reeds, where the river Macquarie disappeared. Natives spoke of large waters containing great fish. To open up the country, and to ascertain the truth of these rumors, were the objects of this new expedition, which left Sydney in November 1828. It consisted of Hamilton Hume, the first Australian-born explorer, two soldiers, eight convicts, fifteen horses, ten bullocks, and a small boat on a wheeled carriage. Across the roadless blue mountains they started, followed the traces of Oxley, who had died just a week before they started, and about Christmas time they passed his last camp and began to break new ground. Through thickets of reeds and marshy swamps they pushed on. The river Macquarie had entirely disappeared, but on 2nd February, they suddenly found a large river, some eighty yards broad, enclosing an unbroken sheet of deep water. Our surprise and delight, says Sturt, are better imagined than described. Our difficulties seemed at an end. The banks were too steep to allow of watering the cattle, but the men eagerly descended to quench a thirst, increased by the powerful sun. Never shall I forget their cry of amazement, nor the terror and disappointment with which they called out that the water was too salt to drink. Leaving his party 
Sturt pushed on, but no fresh water was to be found, so he named the river the Darling, after the governor, and returned. But not till he had discovered Brian Springs in the bed of the river, which accounted for its saltness. Sturt had found no inland sea, but in the Darling he had discovered a main channel of the western watershed. He now proposed to follow the line of the Murumbiji, a river of considerable size and impetuous current, and to trace it, if possible, into the interior. Several of his old party again joined him, and once more he rode out of Sydney on this new quest. The journey to the banks of the Murumbiji lay through wild and romantic country, but as they journeyed farther, broad reed belts appeared by the river, which was soon lost in a vast expanse of reeds. For a moment or two Sturt was as one stunned. He could neither sleep nor rest, till he had regained the river again. When at last he did, so he found the water was deep, the current rapid, and the banks high. But he turned on all hands to build the whale-boat, which he had designed at Sydney for the purpose. Early in January he writes home, I was checked in my advance by high reeds, spreading as far as the eye can reach. The Merumbiji is a magnificent stream. I do not yet know its fate, but I have taken to the boats. Where I shall wander to, God only knows. I have little doubt, however, that I shall ultimately make the coast. By 6th of January the boat was ready and Sturt started on his memorable voyage. After passing the junction of the Lachlan, the channel gradually narrowed. Great trees had been swept down by the floods, and navigation rendered very dangerous. Still narrower grew the stream, stronger the current. On a sudden, the river took a general southern direction. We were carried at a fearful rate down its gloomy banks, and at such a moment of excitement had little time to pay attention to the country through which we were passing. At last we found we were approaching a junction, and within less than a minute we were hurried into a broad and noble river. It is impossible to describe the effect upon us of so instantaneous a change. We gazed in silent wonder on the large channel we had entered. The Mirumbiji had joined the great Murray River, as Sturt now called it, after Sir George Murray of the Colonial Department. To add to the unknown dangers of the way, numbers of natives now appeared in force on the banks of the river, threatening the white men with dreadful yells and with the beating of spears and shields. Firearms alone saved the little crew, and the rage of the natives was turned to admiration, as they watched the white man paddling on their great river, while some seventy black men swam off to the boat like a parcel of seals. The explorers now found a new and beautiful stream flowing into the Mary from the north, on which the boat was now turned, natives anxiously following along the grassy banks, till suddenly a net stretched across the stream checked their course. Sturt instinctively felt he was on the river Darling again. I directed that the Union Jack should be hoisted, and we all stood up in the boat and gave three distinct cheers. The eye of every native was fixed upon that beautiful flag as it waved over us in the heart of a desert. While they were still watching, Sturt turned the head of the boat and pursued his way down the great Murray River. Stormy weather at the end of January set in. Though they were yet one hundred and fifteen miles from the coast, the river increased in breadth, cliffs towered above them, and the water dashed like sea waves at their base. On the 5th of February they were cheered by the appearance of seagulls and a heavy swell up the river, which they knew must be nearing the sea. On the twenty-third day of their voyage they entered a great lake, Crossing to the southern shore, they found to their bitter grief that shoals and sandbanks made it impossible for them to reach the sea. 
They found that the Mary flowed into Encounter Bay, but thither they could not pass. The thunder of the surf upon the shore brought no hope to the tired explorers. They had no alternative but to turn back and retrace their way. Terrible was the task that lay before them. On half rations, and with hostile natives to encounter, they must fight their way against wind and stream. And they did it. They reached the camp on the Murumbiji just seventy-seven days after leaving it, but to their dismay it was deserted. The river, too, had risen in flood, and poured its turbid waters with great violence. For seventeen days, says Sturt, we pulled against stream with determined perseverance, but in our short daily journeys we made but trifling way against it. The effects of severe toil were painfully evident. The men lost the muscular jerk with the oars. Their arms were nerveless, their faces haggard, their persons emaciated, their spirits wholly spent. From sheer weariness they fell asleep at the oar. No murmur, however, escaped them. "'I must tell the captain to-morrow,' said one, thinking that Sturt was asleep, that I can pull no more. But when the morrow came he said no word, but pulled on with his remaining strength. One man went mad. The last ounce of floor was consumed when relief arrived, and the weary explorers at last reached Sydney with their great news. The result of this discovery was soon seen. In 1886, a shipload of English emigrants arrived off Kangaroo Island, and soon a flourishing colony was established at the mouth of the Moray River, the site of the new capital being called Adelaide, after the wife of William IV. After this Sturt tried to cross Australia from south to north, but though he opened up a good deal of new country, he failed to reach the coast. He was rewarded by the president of the Royal Geographical Society, who described him as one of the most distinguished explorers and geographers of our age. The feat of crossing Australia from south to north, from shore to shore, was reserved for an Irishman called Burke in the year 1861. The story of his expedition, though it was successful, is one of the saddest in the history of discovery. The party left Melbourne in the highest spirits. No expense had been spared to give them a good outfit. Camels had been imported from India, with native drivers, and food was provided for a year. The men of Melbourne turned out in their hundreds to see the start of Burke with his four companions, his camels and his horses. Starting in August 1860, the expedition arrived at Cooper's Creek in November, with half their journey done. But it was not till December that the party divided, and Burke with his companions, Wills, King and Gray, six camels and two horses, with food for three months, started off for the coast, leaving the rest at Cooper's Creek to await their return in about three months. After hard going, they reached a channel with tidal waters flowing into the Gulf of Carpentaria on 28th March. But they could not get a view of the open ocean because of boggy ground. They accomplished their task, but the return journey was disastrous. Short rations soon began to tell, for they had taken longer than they had calculated, and no food was to be found by the way. Gray was the first to fail and to die. Heavy rains made the ground impossibly heavy, and the camels sank to the ground exhausted. Finally they had to be killed and eaten. Then the horses went. At long last the three weary men and two utterly worn-out camels dragged themselves to Cooper's Creek, hoping to find their companions and the food they had left there four months ago. It was 21st of April. Not a soul was to be seen. King, cried Wills, in utter despair, they are gone. As the awful truth flashed on them, 
Burke, their leader, threw himself on to the ground, realizing their terrible situation. They looked round. On a tree they saw the word dig. In a bottle they found a letter. We leave the camp today, 21st of April, 1861. We have left you some food. We take camels and horses. Only a few hours ago the party had left Cooper's Creek, and the explorers were too weak and tired to follow. They ate a welcome supper of oatmeal porridge, and then, after resting a couple of days, they struggled on their way. Three exhausted men and two tired camels. Their food was soon finished, and they had to subsist on a black seed, like the natives, called nardu. But they grew weaker and weaker, and the way was long. The camels died first, then wheels grew too ill to walk, and there was nothing for it but to leave him and push on for help. The natives were kind to him, but he was too far gone, and he died before help could arrive. Burke and King sadly pushed on without him, but a few days later Burke died, and in the heart of Australia the one white man, King, was left alone. It was not till the following September that he was found, sitting in a hut that the blacks had made for him. He presented a melancholy appearance, wasted to a shadow, and hardly to be distinguished as a civilized being, except by the remnants of clothes on him. So, out of that gay party of explorers who left Melbourne in the summer of 1860, only one man returned to tell the story of success and the sadder story of suffering and disaster. End of chapter 59「Chapter sixty of a book of discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A book of discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter sixty. Ross makes discoveries in the Antarctic seas. Now, while explorers were busy opening up Australian inland, Ross was leaving the Australian waters for his voyage to the south. Four years after the return of the Ross Polar Expedition, Sir John Franklin had been made governor of Van Diemen's Land, where he was visited by the ships sent out from England on the first Antarctic expedition under the command of Sir James Ross who had returned to find himself famous for his discovery of the North Magnetic Pole. An expedition had been fitted out, consisting of the Erebus and the Terror, ships which later on made history. For did they not carry Sir John Franklin to his doom in the Arctic regions some years later? The ships sailed in the autumn of 1839 by way of the Cape of Good Hope, and excited great interest at Hobart Town, where the commanders, Ross and Crozier, were warmly received by the governor. In a bay, afterwards called Roscoe, the ships were repaired after the long voyage, while an observatory was built by the convicts under the personal supervision of Sir John Franklin. Interesting news awaited the explorers, too, at Hobart Town. Exploration had taken place in the southern regions by a French expedition under Darville and an American, Lieutenant Wilkes, both of which had made considerable discoveries. Ross was somewhat surprised at this, for, as he said, England had ever led the way of discovery in the southern as well as in the northern regions. But he decided to take a more easterly course, and, if possible, to reach the South Magnetic Pole. On 5th November, 1840, the ships were off again, shaping their course for Auckland Island, 900 miles from Hobart Town. The island had been discovered in 1806 by Captain Bristow. 
he had left some pigs, whose rapid increase filled the explorers with surprise. Christmas Day found them still sailing south, with strong gales, snow and rain. The first iceberg was seen a few days later, and land on 11th January. It was a beautifully clear evening, says Ross, and we had a most enchanting view of the two magnificent ranges of mountains, whose lofty peaks, perfectly covered with eternal snow, rose to elevations of 10,000 feet above the level of the ocean. These icy shores were unhospitable enough, and the heavy surf, breaking along its edge, forbade any landing. Indeed, a strong tide carried the ships rapidly and dangerously along the coast, among huge masses of ice. The ceremony of taking possession of these newly discovered lands, in the name of our most gracious sovereign Queen Victoria, was proceeded with. And on planting the flag of our country, amid the hearty cheers of our party, we drank to the health, long life and happiness of Her Majesty, and His Royal Highness, Prince Albert. The end of the month found them farther south than any explorer had sailed before. Everything was new, and they were suddenly startled to find two volcanoes, one of which was active, steam and smoke rising to a height of two thousand feet above the crater, and descending as mist and snow. Mount Erebus and Mount Terror, Ross called them, in memory of his two ships. They sailed on, but soon were stopped by a huge barrier of solid ice, like a great white wall, one thousand feet thick, and one hundred and eighty feet above sea level. They knew now they could get no further this season. They had reached a point one hundred and sixty miles from the pole. Could they but have wintered here, in sight of the brilliant burning mountain, and at so short a distance from the magnetic pole, they might easily have reached it the following spring, so they thought, but reluctantly Ross had to turn. Few can understand the deep feelings of regret with which I felt myself compelled to abandon the perhaps too ambitious hope I had so long cherished of being permitted to plant the flag of my country on both magnetic poles of our globe. The whole of the great southern land they had discovered received the name of Queen Victoria, which name it keeps today. They had been south of the Antarctic Circle for sixty-three days, when they recrossed it on 4th of March. A few days later they narrowly escaped shipwreck. An easterly wind drove them among some hundreds of icebergs. For eight hours, says Ross, we had been gradually drifting towards what to human eyes appeared inevitable destruction. The high waves and deep rolling of our ships rendered towing with boats impossible, and our situation was the more painful from our inability to make any effort to avoid the dreadful calamity that seemed to await us. The roar of the surf, which extended each way as far as we could see, and the dashing of the ice fell upon the ear with painful distinctness, as we contemplated the awful destruction that threatened in one short hour to close the world and all its hopes and joys and sorrows upon us for ever. In this deep distress we called upon the Lord, and our cry came before Him. A gentle air of wind filled our sails. Hope again revived, and before dark we found ourselves far removed from every danger. April found them back again in Van Diemen's land. And though Ross sailed again the following autumn into southern latitudes, he only reached a point some few miles farther than before, being again stopped by a great wall barrier of thick ice. After this he took his ship home by way of Cape Horn, and the shores of old England came into view on the 2nd of September, 1843. After an absence of four years, Ross was welcomed home, and honors were showered on him, including the award of the gold medal of the Royal Geographical Society of Paris. 
Till then they had deemed that the austral earth, with a long unbroken shore, ran on to the pole Antarctic, for such was the old sea lore. End of chapter 60「Chapter sixty one of a Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter sixty one. Franklin Discovers the Northwest Passage. The whole coastline of North America had now been charted. But the famous Northwest Passage, for which so many lives had been laid down, had yet to be found. Sir John Barrow, the father of modern Arctic discovery, secretary to the Admiralty, now decided to dispatch another expedition to forge this last link and to connect, if possible, the chain of all former discoveries. Many were the volunteers who came forward to serve in the new Arctic expedition. But Sir John Franklin claimed the command as his special right. No service, he declared, is nearer to my heart. He was reminded that rumor put his age at sixty, and that after a long life of hard work he had earned some rest. No, no, cried the explorer, I'm only fifty-nine. This decided the point and Franklin was appointed to the Erebus and Terror, recently returned from the Antarctic expedition of Sir James Ross. The ships were provisioned for three years, and with a crew of 129 men and several officers, Sir John Franklin left England for the last time, on 19th May, 1845. He was never seen again. All were in the highest spirits, determined to solve the mystery of the Northwest Passage once and for all. So certain were they of success that one of the officers wrote to a friend, write to Panama and the Sandwich Islands every six months. On 4th of July, the ships anchored near the island of Disco on the west coast of Greenland, after which all is silence. The rest of the story one of the saddest ever told in connection with Arctic exploration, is dovetailed together from the various scraps of information that have been collected by those who sailed in search of the lost expedition year by year. In 1848, Sir James Ross had sailed off in search of his missing friend, and had reached a spot within 300 miles of the Erebus and Terror, four months after they had been abandoned but he returned with no news of Franklin. Then Sir R John Richardson started off, but found no trace. Others followed. The government offered twenty thousand pounds, to which Lady Franklin added three thousand pounds, to anyone who should bring news of Franklin. By the autumn of 1850, there were fifteen ships engaged in the search. A few traces were found, it was discovered that Sir John Franklin had spent his first winter, 1845, at Beachy Island. Carlin McClure sailed along the north coast of America and made his way from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean, thus showing the existence of a northwest passage, for which he and his men were highly rewarded, for at this time no one knew that Franklin had already found a passage, though he had not lived to tell the story of triumph and success. But it was not till after years of silence that the story of the missing expedition was cleared up. Lady Franklin purchased and fitted out a little steam yacht, the Fox, of 177 tons. The command was given to Captain McClintock, known to be an able and enthusiastic Arctic navigator. He was to rescue any possible survivor of the Erebus and Terror, and to try and recover any records of the lost expedition. The 12th of August found the little fox in Melville Bay, made fast to an iceberg, and a few days later she was frozen firmly into an ice pack. 
For two hundred and forty-two days she was beset, drifting all through the long, bitter winter with the ice. Till on twenty-fifth of April, 1858, after having been carried over a thousand miles, she was released. McClintock, undaunted by danger, turned northwards, and by May he had reached Melville Bay. Then up Lancaster Sound, he reached Beachy Island in August, and found there three lonely graves of three sailors from the Erebus and Terror. Here the English commander erected a tablet sent out by Lady Franklin. On the morning of 16th August, McClintock sailed from Beachy Island, but the short summer was passing quickly, and they had no fresh news of the Franklin expedition. Halfway through Bellot Strait, the fox was again ice-bound, and another long winter had to be faced. By the middle of February, 1859, there was light enough to start some sledging along the west coast of Boothia Felix. Days passed, and McClintock struggled on to the south, but no Eskimos appeared, and no traces of the lost explorers were to be found. Suddenly they discovered four men walking after them. A naval button on one of the Eskimos attracted their attention. It came, said the Eskimo, from some white people, who were starved upon an island where there are salmon, but none of them had seen the white man. Here was news at last. McClintock travelled on some ten miles to Cape Victoria, where the Eskimos built him a commodious snow hut in half an hour. Next morning the entire village of Eskimos arrived, some forty-five people, bringing relics of the white man. There were silver spoons, part of a gold chain, buttons, knives, made of the iron and wood of the wrecked ships. But none of those people had seen the white men. One man said he had seen their bones upon the island where they died, but some were buried. They said a ship, having three masts, had been crushed by the ice, out in the sea, to the west of King William's Island. One old man made a rough sketch of the coastline, with his spear upon the snow. He said it was eight journeys to where the ship sank. McClintock hastened back to the ship with his news. He had by his sled journey added one hundred and twenty miles to the old charts, and completed the discovery of the coastline of continental America. On 2nd April, more sledge parties started out to reach King William's Island. The cold was still intense, the glare of the sun painful to their eyes. The faces and lips of the men were blistered and cracked. Their fingers were constantly frostbitten. After nearly three weeks traveling, they found snow huts and Eskimos at Cape Victoria. Here they found more traces of Franklin's party preserved meat tins, brass knives, a mahogany board. In answer to their inquiries, they heard that two ships had been seen by the natives of King William's Island. One had been seen to sink in deep water, the other was forced on shore and broken up. It was in the fall of the year, August or September, they said, when the ships were destroyed, that all the white people went away to the large river, taking a boat with them, and that in the following winter their bones were found there. McClintock now made his way to the opposite coast of King William's Island. Here he found Eskimos with pieces of silver plate, bearing the crest and initials of Sir John Franklin and some of his officers. They said it was five days' journey to the wreck, of which little now remained. There had been many books, said the Eskimos, but they had been destroyed by the weather. One woman volunteered a statement. Many of the white men, she said, dropped by the way as they went to the great river. Some were buried, and some were not. Their bodies were discovered during the winter following. Moving onwards, McClintock reached the great fish river on the morning of 12th May. A furious gale was raging, and the air was heavy with snow, but they encamped there to search for relics. With pickaxes and shovels, they searched in vain. 
no Eskimos were to be found, and at last, in despair, the little party of explorers faced homewards. McClintock was slowly walking near the beach when he suddenly came upon a human skeleton, laying face downwards, half buried in the snow. It wore a blue jacket with slashed sleeves and braided edging and a greatcoat of pillot clothes. The old woman was right. They fell down and died as they walked along. And now the reward of the explorers was at hand. On the northwest coast of King William's Island was found a cairn and a blue ship's paper, weather-worn and ragged, relating in simple language, written by one of the ship's officers, the fate of the Franklin expedition. The first entry was cheerful enough. In 1846 all was well. His Majesty's ships, Erebus and Terror, wintered in the ice at Beachy Island, after having ascended Wellington Channel, and returned to the west side of Cornwallis Island. Sir John Franklin was commanding the expedition. The results of their first year's labor was encouraging. In 1846 they had been within twelve miles of King William's Island, when winter stopped them. But a later entry, written in April 1848, states that the ships were deserted on 22nd of April, having been beset in ice since September 1846. That Sir John Franklin had died on 11th of June 1847, and that Captain Crozier was in command. Then came the last words, and start tomorrow, 26th, for Backfish River. That was all. After a diligent search in the neighborhood for journals or relics, McClintock led his party along the coast, till on 30th May they found another relic, in the shape of a large boat, which a quantity of tattered clothing lying in her. She had been evidently equipped for the ascent of the Great Fish River. She had been built at Woolwich Dockyard. Near her lay two human skeletons, a pair of worker slippers, some watches, guns, a wicker of Wakefield, a small Bible, New Testament and prayer book, seven or eight pairs of boots, some silk handkerchiefs, towels, soap, sponge, combs, twine, nails, shot and cartridges, needle and thread cases, some tea and chocolate, and a little tobacco. Everything was carefully collected and brought back to the ship, which was reached on 19th June. Two months later the little fox was free from ice, and McClintock reached London towards the end of September to make known his great discovery. The rest of the story is well known. Most of us know the interesting collection of Franklin relics in the United Service Institution in London and the monument in Waterloo Place to the great navigator and his brave companions who sacrificed their lives in completing the discovery of the Northwest Passage. It was acknowledged that to Sir John Franklin is due the priority of discovery of the Northwest Passage, that last link to forge which he sacrificed his life. And on a marble monument in Westminster Abbey, Tennyson, a nephew of Sir John Franklin, wrote his well-known lines. Not here, the white north has thy bones, and thou, heroic sailor soul, art passing on thy happier voyage now, towards no earthly pole. End of chapter 61「Chapter 62 of a Book of Discovery」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 62 David Livingstone I shall open up a path to the interior or perish. Such were the words of one of the greatest explorers of Africa in the nineteenth century. Determination was the keynote of his character, even as a young boy. 
At the age of ten he was at work in a cotton factory in Scotland. With his first week's wages he bought a Latin grammar. Fourteen hours of daily work left little time for reading. But he educated himself till at nineteen he was resolved to be a medical missionary. In the glow of love which Christianity inspires, I resolved to devote my life to the alleviation of human misery. He was accepted for service by the London Missionary Society, and in the year 1840 he sailed for South Africa. After a voyage of three months, he arrived at Cape Town, and made his way, in a slow ox wagon, seven hundred miles to Kuruman, a small mission station in the heart of Bekwana land, where Dr. Moffat had labored for twenty years. He did well, and two years later he was sent north to form another mission station at Mabotsa, Transvaal. Having married Moffat's daughter Mary, he worked in these parts till June 1849, when, with his wife and three children, he started with oxen and wagon for a journey northwards. Across the great Kalahari desert moved the exploring family, till they came to the river called Zoga, which, said the natives, led to a large lake named Lake Ngami. In native canoes, Livingstone and his little family ascended this beautiful wooded river, resembling the River Clyde above Glasgow. Till on the 1st of August, 1849, Lake Ngami appeared. And for the first time, says Livingstone, this fine sheet of water was beheld by Europeans. The lake was 2,800 feet above the sea, but the climate was terribly unhealthy. The children grew feverish, and mosquitoes made life a misery to them, while the tsetse fly made further exploration for the moment impossible. So the family journeyed back to headquarters for a time. But Livingstone was unsatisfied, and once more in 1851 we find him starting again with wife and children to seek the great river Zambezi, known to exist in Central Africa though the Portuguese maps represented it as rising far to the east of Livingstone's discovery. It was the end of June, 1851, he tells us, that we were rewarded by the discovery of the Zambezi in the center of the continent. This was an important point, for that river was not previously known to exist there at all. As we were the very first white men, the inhabitants had ever seen, we were visited by prodigious numbers of Makololo, in garments of blue, green, and red bays. Livingstone wanted to know more of this unknown river, but he now decided that exploring with a wife and family was not only perilous, but difficult. So he returned to the coast, put them on a homeward-bound ship for England, and returned to Central Africa, to continue his work of exploration alone. It was 11th November, 1858, when Livingstone left the town of Linyanti, in the very heart of Central Africa, for his great journey to the west coast to trace the course of the Zambezi. The Zambezi, nobody knows whence it comes and whither it goes. So ran an old canoe song of the natives. With twenty-seven faithful black Makololos, with only a few biscuits, a little tea and sugar, twenty pounds of coffee and three books, with a horse rug and sheepskin for bedding, and a small gypsy tent and a tin canister, fifteen inches square, filled with a spare shirt, trousers and shoes for civilized life, and a few scientific instruments, the English explorer started for a six-month journey. Soon his black guides had embarked in their canoes and were making their way up the Zambezi. No rain has fallen here, he writes on 30th of November, so it is excessively hot. The atmosphere is oppressive both in cloud and sunshine. Livingstone suffered badly from fever during the entire journey, but the blacks took fatherly care of him. 
As soon as we land, he says, The men cut a little grass for my bed, while the poles of my little tent are planted. The bed is made and boxes ranged on each side of it, and then the tent pitched over all. Two Makalolos occupy my right and left, both in eating and sleeping, as long as the journey lasts. But my head boatman makes his bed at the door of the tent as soon as I retire. As they advanced up the Barotsi Valley, rains had fallen, and the woods had put on their gayest hue. Flowers of great beauty grow everywhere. The ground begins to swarm with insect life, and in the cool, pleasant mornings the place rings with the singing of birds. On 6th of January, 1854, they left the river and rode oxen through the dense parts of the country, through which they had now to pass. Through heavy rains and with very little food, they toiled on westward through miles and miles of swamp, intersected by streams, flowing southward to the Zambezi Basin. One day Livingstone's ox, Sindbad, threw him, and he had to struggle wearily forward on foot. His strength was failing. His meager fare, varied by boiled zebra and dried elephant, frequent wettings and constant fever, were reducing him to a mere skeleton. At last, on 26th of March, he arrived at the edge of the high land, over which he had so long been travelling. It is so steep, he tells us, that I was obliged to dismount, and I was so weak that I had to be led by my companions, to prevent my toppling over in walking down. Below us lay the valley of the Quango in glorious sunlight. Another fortnight and they were in Portuguese territory. The sight of white men once more, and the collection of traders' huts, was a welcome sight to the weary traveller. The commandant at once took pity on Livingstone. But after a refreshing stay of ten days, the English explorer started off westward to the coast. For another month he pursued his way. It was 31st May, 1854. As the party neared the town of Luanda, the black Makololos began to grow nervous. We have stood by each other hitherto, and will do so to the last, Livingstone assured them, as they all staggered into the city by the seashore. Here they found one Englishman sent out for the suppression of the slave trade, who at once gave up his bed to the stricken and emaciated explorer. Never shall I forget, he says, the luxury I enjoyed in feeling myself again on a good English bed after six months sleeping on the ground. Nor were the Makalolos forgotten. They were entertained on board an English man of war lying off the coast. Livingstone was offered a passage home, but he tells us, I declined the tempting offers of my friends and resolved to take back my Makololo companions to their chief, with a view of making a path from here to the east coast by means of the great river Zambezi. With this object in view, he turned his back on home and comfort, and on 20th of September, 1854, he left Loanda and the White Man's Sea, as the black guides called the Atlantic Ocean, that washes the shores of West Africa. Their way lay through the Angola country, rich in wild coffee and cotton plantations. The weather was as usual still and oppressive, but slowly Livingstone made his way eastward. He suffered badly from fever, as he had done on the outward journey. It had taken him six months to reach Loanda from Central Africa. It took a year to complete the return journey, and it was September 1855, before Lignanti was again reached. Wagons and goods, left there eighteen months before, were safe, together with many welcome letters from home. The return of the travellers, after so long an absence, was a cause of great rejoicing. All the wonderful things the Makalolos had seen and heard were rehearsed many times before appreciative audiences. 
Livingstone was more than ever a hero in their eyes, and his kindness to his men was not forgotten. He had no difficulty in getting recruits for the journey down the Zambezi to the sea, for which he was now making preparations. On 3rd of November he was ready to resume his long march across Africa. He was much better equipped on this occasion. He rode a horse instead of an ox, and his guide, Sekwebu, knew the river well. The first night out they were unfortunately caught in a terrific thunderstorm, accompanied by sheet lightning, which lit up the whole country and flooded it with torrents of tropical rain. A few days' travelling brought the party to the famous Zambezi Falls, called by the natives where smoke sounds, but renamed by Livingstone after the Queen of England, Victoria. The first account of these now famous falls is very vivid. Five columns of vapour, appropriately named smoke, bending in the direction of the wind, appeared to mingle with the clouds. The whole scene was extremely beautiful. It had never been seen before by European eyes. When about half a mile from the falls, I left the canoe and embarked in a lighter one, with men well acquainted with the rapids, who brought me to an island in the middle of the river and on the edge of the lip, over which the water rolls. Creeping with care to the verge, I peered down into a large rent which had been made from bank to bank of the broad Zambezi, in looking down into the fissure, one sees nothing but a dense white cloud. From this cloud rushed up a great jet of vapor, exactly like steam, and it mounted two or three hundred feet high. Livingstone now continued his perilous journey with his hundred men along the Zambezi. The country once densely populated, now desolate and still. The Bakota tribes, the color of coffee and milk, were friendly, and great numbers came from all the surrounding villages and expressed great joy at the appearance of a white man and harbinger of peace. They brought in large supplies of food and expressed great delight when Livingstone doctored their children, who were suffering from whooping cough. As they neared the coast, they became aware of hostile forces. This was explained when they were met by a Portuguese half-caste, with jacket and hat on, who informed them that for the last two years they had been fighting the natives. Plunging thus unconsciously into the midst of a Kafir war rendered traveling unpleasant and dangerous. In addition, the party of explorers found their animals woefully bitten by the tsetse fly, rhinoceroses and elephants, were too plentiful to be interesting, and the great white ant made itself tiresome. It was sort of March before Livingstone reached Tete, two hundred and sixty miles from the coast. The last stages of the journey had been very beautiful. Many of the hills were of pure white marble, and pink marble formed the bed of more than one of the streams. Through this country the Zambezi rolled down toward the coast, at the rate of four miles an hour, while flocks of waterfowl swarmed upon its banks or flew over its waters. Tete was the farthest outpost of the Portuguese. Livingstone was most kindly received by the governor, but fever again laid him low, and he had to remain here for three weeks before he was strong enough to start for the last stage of his journey to the coast. He left his Makololos here, promising to return some day to take them home again. They believed in him implicitly and remained there three years when he returned according to his word. Leaving Tete, he now embarked on the waters of the Zambezi, high with a fourth annual rise, which bore him to Sena in five days. So swift is the current at times that twenty-four hours is enough to take a boat from Tete to Sena, whereas the return journey may take twenty days. I thought the state of Tete quite lamentable, says Livingstone, but that of Sena was ten times worse. It is impossible to describe the miserable state of decay 
into which the Portuguese possessions here have sunk. So suffering badly from fever, Livingstone pushed on. He passed the important tributary of the Zambezi, the Shire, which he afterwards explored, and finally reached Quilimani on the shores of the Indian Ocean. It was now 20th of May, 1856, just four years after he had left Cape Town on his great journey from west to east, since when he had travelled 11,000 miles. After waiting six weeks on the great mud bank, surrounded by extensive swamps and rice grounds, which forms the site of Quillimane, Livingstone embarked on board a gunboat, the Frolic, for England. He had one Mokololo with him, the faithful Sekwebu. The poor black man begged to be allowed to follow his master on the seas. But, said Livingstone, you will die if you go to such a cold country as mine. Let me die at your feet, pleaded the black man. He had not been to Loanda. He had never seen the sea before. Waves were breaking over the bar at Qualimane, and dashing over the boat that carried Sequibu out to the brig. He was terribly alarmed, but he lived to reach Mauritius, where he became insane, hurled himself into the sea, and was drowned. On 12th of December, 1856, Livingstone landed in England, after an absence of sixteen years. He had left home as an obscure missionary. He returned to find himself famous. The Royal Geographical Society awarded him its gold medal. France and Scotland hastened to do him honor. Banquets and receptions were given for him. And finally this plain, single-minded man, somewhat attenuated by years of toil, and with his face tinged by the sun of Africa, was received by the Queen at Windsor. The enthusiasm aroused by this longest expedition in the history of African travel was unrivaled, and the name of Livingstone was on every lip. But meanwhile others were at work in Central Africa, and we must turn from the discoveries of Livingstone for the moment. End of chapter 62「Livingstone had just left Loanda and was making his way across Africa from west to east, when an English expedition set forth to find the great lakes still lying solitary and undiscovered, although they were known to exist. If we turn to the oldest maps of Africa, we find, rudely drawn and incorrectly placed, large inland waters that may nevertheless be recognized as these lakes just about to be revealed to a wandering world. Ptolemy knew of them, the Arabs spoke of them, Portuguese traders had passed them, and a German missionary had caught sight of the mountains of the moon and brought back strange stories of a great inland lake. The work of rediscovering the lakes was entrusted to a remarkable man named Richard Burton, a man whose love of adventure was well known. He had already shown his mettle by entering Mecca, disguised as a Persian, and disguised as an Arab he had entered Harar, a den of slave traders, the Timbuktu of eastern Africa. On his return he was attacked by the Somalis, one of his companions was killed, another, Speak, escaped with terrible spear wounds, and he himself was badly wounded. Such were the men who in 1856 were dispatched by the Royal Geographical Society for the exploration of the mysterious lakes in the heart of Central Africa. Speak gives us an idea of the ignorance prevailing on this subject only fifty-six years ago. On the walls of the Society's rooms there hung a large diagram 
constructed by two missionaries carrying on their duties at Zanzibar. In this section map, swallowing up about half of the whole area of the ground included in it, there figured a lake of such portentous size and such unseemly shape, representing a gigantic slug, that everybody who looked at it incredulously laughed and shook his head. A single sheet of sweet water, upwards of eight hundred miles long by three hundred broad, equal in size to the great salt Caspian. It was April 1857, before Burton and Speke had collected an escort and guides at Zanzibar, the great slave market of East Africa, and were ready to start for the interior. We could obtain no useful information from the European merchants of Zanzibar, who are mostly ignorant of everything beyond the island. Burke wrote home on 22nd of April. At last on 27th of June, with thirty-six men and thirty donkeys, the party set out for the great malarious coast belt, which had to be crossed before Kaze, some five hundred miles distant, could be reached. After three months' arduous travelling, both Burton and Speke were badly stricken with fever. They reached Kaze. Speke now spread open the map of the missionaries and inquired of the natives where the enormous lake was to be found. To their intense surprise they found the missionaries had run three lakes into one, and the three lakes were Lake Nuessa, Tanganyika, and Victoria Nyanza. They stayed over a month at Kaze, till Burton seemed at the point of death, and Speak had him carried out of the unhealthy town. It was January before they made a start and continued their journey westward to Ugi. It is a wonderful thing, says Drummond, to start from the civilization of Europe, pass up these mighty rivers, and work your way alone and on foot, mile after mile, month after month, among strange birds and beasts and plants and insects, meeting tribes which have no name, speaking tongues which no man can interpret, till you have reached its sacred heart and stood where white man has never trod before. As the two men tramped on, the streams began to drain to the west, and the land grew more fertile, till one hundred and fifty miles from Kaze, they began to ascend the slope of mountains, overhanging the northern half of Lake Tanganyika. This mountain mass, says Speke, I consider to be the true mountains of the moon. From the top of the mountains, the lovely Tanganyika Lake could be seen in all its glory by Burton. But to speak it was a mere mist. The glare of the sun and oft-repeated fever had begun to tell on him, and a kind of inflammation had produced almost total blindness. But they had reached the lake, and they felt sure they had found the source of the Nile. It was a great day when Speak crossed the lake in a long canoe hollowed out of the trunk of a tree, and manned by twenty native savages, under the command of a captain in a goatskin uniform. On the far side they encamped on the opposite shore, Speak being the first white man to cross the lake. Having retired to his hut for the night, Speak proceeded to light a candle and arrange his baggage when to his horror he found the whole interior swarming with black beetles. Tired of trying to brush them away, he put out his light, and though they crawled up his sleeves and down his back, he fell asleep. Suddenly he woke to find one crawling into his ear, and in spite of his frantic efforts it crept in farther and farther, till it reached the drum, which caused the tired explorer intense agony. Inflammation ensued. His face became drawn. He could with difficulty swallow a little broth, and he was quite deaf. He returned across the lake to find his companion, Burton, still very ill and unfit for further exploration. So speak, although still suffering from his ear, started off again, leaving Burton behind to find the great northern lake spoken of as the Sea of Ukereve, where the Arabs traded largely in ivory. There was a great empire beyond the lake 
they told him, called Uganda. But it was July 1858 when the caravan was ready to start from Kaze. Speak himself carried Burton's large elephant gun. I commenced the journey, he says, at 6 p.m., as soon as the two donkeys I took with me to ride were caught and saddled. It was a dreary beginning. The escort who accompanied me were sullen in their manner and walked with heavy gait and downcast countenance. The nature of the track increased the general gloom. For several weeks the caravan moved forward, till on the 3rd of August it began to wind up a long but gradually inclined hill, until it reached its summit, when the vast expanse of the pale blue waters of the Nyanza burst suddenly upon my eyes. It was early morning. The distant sea line of the north horizon was defined in the calm atmosphere, but I could get no idea of the breadth of the lake as an archipelago of islands, each consisting of a single hill rising to a height of two or three hundred feet above the water, intersected the line of vision to the left. A sheet of water extended far away to the eastward. The view was one which even in a well-known country would have arrested the traveller by its peaceful beauty. But the pleasure of the mere view vanished in the presence of those more intense emotions called up by the geographical importance of the scene before me. I no longer felt any doubt that the lake at my feet gave birth to that interesting river, Nile, the source of which has been the subject of so much speculation and the object of so many explorers. This is a far more extensive lake than Tanganyika. It is so broad that you could not see across it, and so long that nobody knew its length. This magnificent sheet of water I have ventured to name Victoria, after our gracious sovereign. Speak returned to Kaze after six weeks' eventful journey, having tramped no less than 452 miles. He received a warm welcome from Burton, who had been very uneasy about his safety, for rumors of civil war had reached him. I laughed over the matter, says Speak, but expressed my regret that he did not accompany me, as I felt quite certain in my mind I had discovered the source of the Nile. Together the two explorers now made their way to the coast, and crossed to Aden, where Burton, still weak and ill, decided to remain for a little, while Speak took passage in a passing ship for home. When he showed his map of Tanganyika and Victoria Nyanza to the President of the Royal Geographical Society of London, Sir Roderick Murchison was delighted. Speak, we must send you there again, he said enthusiastically. And the expedition was regarded as one of the most notable discoveries in the annals of African discovery. End of chapter 63「Chapter sixty four of a book of discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A book of discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter sixty four. Livingstone traces Lake Shirva and Nuyessa. Burton and Speke had not yet returned from Central Africa when Livingstone left England on another expedition into the interior, with orders to extend the knowledge already attained of the geography of eastern and central Africa, and to encourage trade. Leaving England on 10th of March, 1858, he reached the east coast the following May as British Consul of Quilimane, the region which lies about the mouth of the Zambezi. Livingstone had brought out with him a small steam lounge called by the natives the Ma Robert, after Mrs. Livingstone, the mother of Robert, their eldest child. In this little steam lounge he made his way up the Shire River, which flows into the Zambezi quite near its mouth. The delight of threading out the meanderings of upwards of two hundred miles of a hitherto unexplored river 
must be felt to be appreciated, says Livingstone in his diary. At the end of this two hundred miles, further progress became impossible because of rapids which no boat could pass. These magnificent cataracts we called the Merchants and Cataracts, after one whose name has already a worldwide fame, says Livingstone. Leaving their boat here, they started on foot for the great lake described by the natives. It took them a month of hard traveling to reach their goal. Their way lay over the native tracks which run as a network over this part of the world. They are veritable footpaths, never over a foot in breadth, beaten as hard as adamant by centuries of native traffic. Like the roads of the old Romans, they run straight on over everything, ridge and mountain and valley. On 18th April, Lake Shirva came into sight. A considerable body of bitter water containing leeches, fish, crocodiles, and hippopotami. The country around is very beautiful, adds Livingstone, enclosed with rich vegetation, and the waves breaking and foaming over a rock added to the beauty of the picture. Exceedingly lofty mountains stand near the eastern shore. No white man had gazed at the lake before. Though one of the smaller African lakes, Shirva is probably larger than all the lakes of Great Britain put together. Returning to Tete, the explorer now prepared for his journey for the farther lake Nyasa. This was to be no new discovery. The Portuguese knew the locality of Lake Shirva, and at the beginning of the 17th century, Nyasa was familiar to them under another name. Landing at the same spot on the Shire banks as before, Livingstone with 36 Makololo porters and two native guides, ascended the beautiful Shire Highlands, some 1,200 feet above sea level, and crossed the range on which Zomba, the residence of the British commissioner of Nyasa land, now stands. When within a day's march of their goal, they were told that no lake had ever been heard of in the neighborhood. But, said the natives, the river Shire stretched on, and it would take two months to reach the end, which came out of perpendicular rocks which towered almost to the skies. Let us go back to the ship, said the followers. It is no use trying to find the lake. But Livingstone persevered, and he was soon rewarded by finding a sheet of water, which was indeed the beginning of Lake Nyasa. It was 16 September, 1856. How far is it to the end of the lake, he asked. The other end of the lake? Who ever heard of such a thing? Why, if one started when a mere boy to walk to the other end of the lake, he would be an old grey-headed man before he got there, declared one of the natives. Livingstone knew that he had opened up a great waterway to the interior of Africa, but the slave trade in these parts was terrible, gangs being employed in carrying the ivory from countries to the north down to the east coast. The English explorer saw that if he could establish a steamer upon this Lake Nyasa and buy ivory from the natives with our European goods, he would at once strike a deadly blow at the slave trade. His letters home stirred several missionaries to come out and establish a settlement on the banks of the Shire River. Bishop Mackenzie and a little band of helpers arrived on the River Shire two years later, and in 1862 Mrs. Livingstone joined them, bringing out with her a little new steamer to launch on the Lake Nyasa. But the unhealthy season was at its height, and the surrounding low land, rank with vegetation and reeking from the late rainy season, exhaled the malarious poison in enormous quantities. Mrs. Livingstone fell ill, and in a week she was dead. She was buried under a large baobab tree at Shapunga, where her grave is visited by many a traveler passing through this once solitary region, first penetrated by her husband. The blow was a crushing one for Livingstone, and for a time he was quite bewildered. But when his old energy returned, he superintended the launching of the little steamer, the Lady Nyasa, but disappointment and failure awaited him, and at last, just two years after the death of his wife, he took the Lady Nyasa to Zanzibar 
by the Rovoma River, and set forth to reach Bombay, where he hoped to sell her, for his funds were low. On the last day of April, 1864, he started on his perilous journey. Though warned that the monsoon would shortly break, he would not be deterred. And after sailing 2,500 miles in the little boat, built only for river and lake, a forest of masts one day loomed through the haze in Bombay Harbor, and he was safe. After a brief stay here, Livingstone left his little lounge and made his way to England on a mail packet. But no one realized at this time the importance of his new discoveries. No one foresaw the value of Nyasa land, now under British protectorate. Livingstone had brought to light a lake, 1,570 feet above the sea, 350 miles long and 40 broad, up and down which British steamers make their way today, while the long range of mountains lining the eastern bank, known as the Livingstone Range, testified to the fact that he had done much, even if he might have done more. End of chapter 64 Chapter 65 of A Book of Discovery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 65 Expedition to Victoria Nyanza While Livingstone was discovering Lake Nyasa, Speak was busy preparing for a new expedition, to find out more about the great sheet of water he had named Victoria Nyanza, and to solve the vexed question, was this the source of the Nile? In April 1860, accompanied by Captain Grant, an old friend and brother sportsman, he left England, and by way of the Cape reached Zanzibar some five months later. The two explorers started for their great inland journey early in October, with some hundred followers, bound for the Great Lake. But it was January 1861, before they had covered the five hundred miles between the coast and Kaze, the old halting station of Burton and Speak. Through the agricultural plains known as Uzarana, the country of Rana, where many Negro porters deserted, because they believed the white men were cannibals, and intended to eat them when safe away from the hounds of men. Through Usagara, the country of Gara, where Captain Grant was seized with fever. Through Ugugo's great wilderness, where buffalo and rhinoceros abounded, where the country was flooded with tropical rains, on to the land of the moon, three thousand feet above sea level, till the slowly moving caravan reached Kaze. Here terrible accounts of famine and war reached them, and instead of following Speak's route of 1858, they turned northwest and entered the Uzinza country, governed by two chieftains of Abyssinian descent. Here Speak was taken desperately ill. His cough gave him no rest day or night. His legs were reduced to the appearance of pipe sticks. But emaciated as he was, he made his way onwards, till the explorers were rewarded by finding a beautiful sheet of water lying snugly within the folds of the hills which they named the Little Windermere, because they thought it was so like our own English lake of that name. To do royal honors to the king of this charming land, I ordered my men, says Speak, to put down their loads and fire a volley. The king, whom they next visited, was a fine-looking man, who with his brother sat cross-legged on the ground, with huge pipes of black clay by their sides, while behind him Squatting quiet as mice were the king's sons, six or seven lads, with little dream charms un under their chins. The king shook hands in true English fashion and was full of inquiries. Speak described the world, the proportions of land and water, and the large ships on the sea, and begged to be allowed to pass through his kingdom to Uganda. The explorers learned much about the surrounding country and spent Christmas Day with a good feast of roast beef. 
the start for Uganda was delayed by the serious illness of Grant, until at last Speak reluctantly decided to leave him with the friendly king, while he made his way alone to Uganda and the Lake Victoria Nyanza. It was the end of January 1861 when the English explorer entered the unknown kingdom of Uganda. Messengers from the king, Mtsesa, came to him. Now, they said, you have really entered the kingdom of Uganda. For the future you must buy no more food. At every place that you stop for the day, the officer in charge will bring you plantains. The king's palace was ten days' march. The way lay along the western coast of the Lake Victoria Nyanza. The roads were as broad as our coach roads, cut through the long grass, straight over the hills, and down through the woods. The temperature was perfect. The whole land was a picture of quiescent beauty, with a boundless sea in the background. On 13th of February, Speak found a large volume of water going to the north. I took off my clothes, he says, and jumped into the stream, which I found was twelve yards broad and deeper than my height. I was delighted beyond measure, for I had, to all appearance, found one of the branches of the Nile's exit from the Nyanza. But he had not reached the Nile yet. It was not till the end of July that he reached his goal. Here at last, he says, I stood on the brink of the Nile. Most beautiful was the scene. Nothing could surpass it. A magnificent stream from six hundred to seven hundred yards wide, dotted with islets and rocks, the former occupied by fishermen's hats, the latter by crocodiles basking in the sun. I told my men they ought to bathe in the holy river, the cradle of Moses. Marching onwards, they found the waterfall, which Speak named the Ripon Falls, by far the most interesting sight I had seen in Africa. The arm of the water from which the Nile issued he named Napoleon Channel, out of respect to the French Geographical Society for the honor they had done him just before leaving England in presenting their gold medal for the discovery of Victoria Nyanza. The English explorers had now spent six months in Uganda. The civilization in this country of Mtsesas has passed into history. Everyone was closed, and even little boys held their skin cloaks tightly round them, lest their bare legs might by accident be seen. Everything was clean and orderly under the all-powerful ruler, Mtsesa. Grant, who arrived in the end of May, carried in a litter, found Speak had not yet obtained leave from the king to open the country to the north, that an uninterrupted line of commerce might exist between England and Uganda by means of the Nile. But at last on 3rd of July he writes with joy, The moment of triumph has come at last, and suddenly the road is granted. The explorers bid farewell to Mtsesa. We rose with an English bow, placing the hand on the heart, whilst saying adieu, and whatever we did Tessa in an instant mimicked with the instinct of a monkey. In five boats of five planks, each tied together and caulked with rags, Speak started with a small escort and crew to reach the palace of the neighboring king, Kamrasi, father of the, all the kings, in the province of Unyoro. After some fierce opposition, they entered the palace of the king, a poor creature. Rumors had reached him that these two white men were cannibals and sorcerers. His palace was indeed a contrast to that of Mtsesa. It was merely a dirty hut approached by a lane ankle deep in mud and cow manure. The king's sisters were not allowed to marry. Their only occupation was to drink milk from morning to night, with the result that they grew so fat it took eight men to lift one of them when walking became impossible. Superstition was rife, and the explorers were not sorry to leave on Euro and route for Cairo. Speak and Grant now believed that except for a few cataracts, the waterway to England was unbroken. The Karuma Falls broke the monotony of the way, and here the party halted a while before plunging into the Kidi wilderness 
across which they intended to march, to save a great bend of the river. Their path lay through swampy jungles and high grass, while great grassy plains, where buffaloes were seen and the roar of lions was heard, stretched away on every side. Suddenly they reached a huge rock covered with huts, in front of which groups of black men were perched like monkeys, evidently awaiting the arrival of the white men. They were painted in the most brilliant colors, though without clothes, for the civilization of Uganda had been left far behind. Pushing on, they reached the muddy country, where again civilization awaited them in the shape of Turks. It was on 3rd of December that they saw, to their great surprise, three large red flags carried in front of a military procession which marched out of camp with drums and fives playing. A very black man named Mohammed, in full Egyptian regimentals, with a curved sword, ordered his regiment to halt, and threw himself into my arms, endeavoring to kiss me, says Speak. Having reached his huts, he gave us two beds to sit upon, and ordered his wives to advance on their knees and give us coffee. I have directions to take you to Gondokoro as soon as you come, said Mohammed. Yet they were detained till 11th of January, when in sheer desperation they started off, and in two days reached the Nile. Having no boats, they continued their march overland till 15th of February, when the masts of Nile boats came in sight, and soon after the two explorers walked into Gondokoro. Then a strange thing happened. We saw hurrying on towards us the form of an Englishman, and the next moment my old friend Baker, famed for his sports in Ceylon, seized me by the hand. What joy this was I can hardly tell. We could not talk fast enough, so overwhelmed were we both to meet again. Of course we were his guests, and soon learned everything that could be told. I now first heard of the death of the prince consort. Baker said, He had come up with three vessels fully equipped with armed men, camels, horses, donkeys, and everything necessary for a long journey, expressly to look after us. Three Dutch ladies also, with a view to assist us, God bless them, had come here in a steamer, but were driven back to Khartoum by sickness. Nobody had dreamt for a moment it was possible we could have come through. Leaving Baker to continue his way to Central Africa, Speak and Grant made their way home to England, where they arrived in safety after an absence of three years and fifty-one days, with their great news of the discovery of Uganda and their further exploration of Victoria Nanza. When Speak reached Alexandria, he had telegraphed home, The Nile is settled. But he was wrong. The Nile was not settled, and many an expedition was yet to make its way to the Great Lakes before the problem was to be solved. End of chapter 65《ジャプト66》《A Book of Discovery》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《A Book of Discovery》by M. B. Singh《Chapter 66》Baker finds Albert Nyanza Baker had not long been at Gondokoro when the two English explorers arrived from the south. In March 1861, he tells us, I commenced an expedition to discover the sources of the Nile, with the hope of meeting the East African expedition of Captains Speak and Grant, that had been sent by the English government from the south, via Zanzibar, for that object. From my youth I had been inured to hardship and endurance in tropical climates, and when I gazed upon the map of Africa, I had a wild hope that I might, by perseverance, reach the heart of Africa. These are the opening lines of the published travels of Samuel Baker, famous as an elephant hunter in Ceylon 
and engineer of the first railway laid down in Turkey. Like Livingstone, in his early explorations, Baker took his wife with him. It was in vain that I implored her to remain, and that I painted the difficulties and perils still blacker than I supposed they really would be. She was resolved to share all dangers, and to follow me through each rough footstep of the wild life before me. On 15th April, 1861, Baker and his wife left Cairo to make their way southward, to join the quest for the source of the Nile. They reached Korosko in twenty-six days, and crossed the Nubian desert on camels, a very wilderness of scorching sand, the simoon in full force, and the thermometer in the shade standing at one hundred and fourteen degrees Fahrenheit. By Abu Hamed and Berber they reached Atbara. It now occurred to Baker that without some knowledge of Arabic, he could do little in the way of exploration. So for a whole year he stayed in northern Abyssinia, the country explored by Bruce nearly ninety years before. It was therefore 18th December, 1862, before he and Mrs. Baker left Khartoum for their journey up the Nile through the slave-driven Sudan. It was a fifty days' voyage to Gondokoro. In the hope of finding Speak and Grand, he took an extra load of corn as well as twenty-two donkeys, four camels, and four horses. Gondokoro was reached just a fortnight before the two explorers returned from the south. Baker's account of the historical meeting between the white men in the heart of Africa is very interesting. Heard guns firing in the distance. Reports that two white men had come from the sea. Could they be speak and grant? Off I ran and soon met them. Hurrah for our old England! They had come from the Victorian Yanza, from which the Nile springs. The mystery of ages solved. With a heart beating with joy, I took off my cap and gave a welcome hurrah as I ran towards them. For the moment they did not recognize me. Ten years' growth of beard and moustache had worked a change, and my sudden appearance in the center of Africa appeared to them incredible. As a good ship arrives in harbor, battered and torn by a long and stormy voyage, so both these gallant travelers arrived in Gondokoro. Speak appeared to me the more worn of the two. He was excessively lean. He had walked the whole way from Zanzibar, never having ridden once during the weary march. Grant was in rags, his bare knees projecting through the remnants of trousers. Baker was now inclined to think that his work was done, the source of the Nile discovered. But after looking at the map of their route, he saw that an important part of the Nile still remained undiscovered, and though there were dangers ahead, he determined to go on his way into Central Africa. We took neither guide nor interpreter, he continues. We commenced our desperate journey in darkness about an hour after sunset. I led the way, Mrs. Baker riding by my side, and the British flag following close behind us as a guide for the caravan of heavily laden camels and donkeys. And thus we started on our march in Central Africa, on the 26th of March, 1863. It would take too long to tell of their manifold misfortunes and difficulties before they reached the lake they were in search of on the 16th March, 1864. How they passed through the uncivilized country so lately traversed by Speak and Grant, how in the Obo country all their porters deserted just a few days before they reached the Karuma Falls, how Baker from this point tried to follow the Nile to the yet unknown lake, how fever seized both the explorer and his wife, and they had to live on the common food of the natives and a little water, how suddenly Mrs. Baker fell down with a sunstroke, and was carried for seven days quite unconscious through swamp and jungle, the rain descending in torrents all the time, till Baker, weak as a reed, worn out with anxiety, lay on the ground as one dead. It seemed as if both must die, when better times dawned, and they recovered to find that they were close to the lake. Baker's diary is eloquent. The day broke beautifully clear, 
and having crossed a deep valley between the hills, we toiled up the opposite slope. I hurried to the summit. The glory of our prize burst suddenly upon me. There, like a sea of quicksilver, lay far beneath us the grand expanse of water, a boundless sea horizon on the south and southwest, glittering in the noonday sun, while at sixty miles' distance blue mountains rose from the lake to a height of about seven thousand feet above its level. It is impossible to describe the triumph of that moment. Here was the reward for all our labor. England had won the sources of the Nile. I looked from the steep granite cliff upon those welcome waters, upon that vast reservoir which nourished Egypt, upon that great source so long hidden from mankind, and I determined to honor it with a great name. As an imperishable memorial of one loved and mourned by our gracious queen, I called this great lake the Albert Nyanza. The Victoria and the Albert Lakes are the two sources of the Nile. Weak and spent with fever, the bakers descended tottering to the water's edge. The waves were rolling upon a white pebbly beach. I rushed into this lake, and thirsty with heat and fatigue, I drank deeply from the sources of the Nile. My wife, who had followed me so devotedly, stood by my side, pale and exhausted, a wreck upon the shores of the great Albert Lake that we had long striven to reach. No European foot had ever trod upon its sand, nor had the eyes of a white man ever scanned its vast expanse of water. After some long delay, the bakers procured canoes, merely single trees neatly hollowed out, and paddled along the shores of the newly found lake. The water was calm, the views most lovely. Hippopotami sported in the water, crocodiles were numerous. Day after day they paddled north, sometimes using a large scotch blade as sail. It was dangerous work. Once a great storm nearly swamped them. The little canoe shipped heavy seas. Terrific bursts of thunder and vivid lightning broke over the lake, hiding everything from view. Then down came the rain in torrents, swept along by a terrific wind. They reached the shore in safety, but the discomforts of the voyage were great, and poor Mrs. Baker suffered severely. On the thirteenth day they found themselves at the end of the lake voyage, and carefully examined the exit of the Nile from the lake. They now followed the river in their canoe for some eighteen miles, when they suddenly heard a roar of water, and rounding a corner, a magnificent sight suddenly burst upon us. On either side of the river were beautifully wooded cliffs, rising abruptly to a height of three hundred feet, and rushing through a gap that cleft the rock. The river pent up in a narrow gorge, roared furiously through the rock-bound pass, till it plunged in one leap of about one hundred and twenty feet into a dark abyss below. This was the greatest waterfall of the Nile, and in honor of the distinguished president of the Royal Geographical Society, I named it the Murchison Falls. Further navigation was impossible, and with oxen and porters they proceeded by land. Mrs. Baker was still carried in a litter, while Baker walked by her side. Both were soon attacked again with fever, and when night came they threw themselves down in a wretched hut. A violent thunderstorm broke over them, and they lay there utterly helpless, and worn out till sunrise. Worse was to come. The natives now deserted them, and they were alone and helpless, with a wilderness of rank grass, hemming them in on every side. Their meals consisted of a mess of black porridge of bitter moldy flour, that no English pig would notice, and a dish of spinach. For nearly two months they existed here, until they became perfect skeletons. We had given up all hope of Gondokoro, says Baker, and I had told my headman to deliver my map and papers to the English consul at Khartoum. But they were not to die here. The king, Kamrasi, having heard of their wretched condition, sent for them 
treated them kindly, and enabled them to reach Gondokoro, which they did on 23rd of March, 1865, after an absence of two years. They had long since been given up as lost, and it was an immense joy to reach Cairo at last, and to find that, in the words of Baker, the Royal Geographical Society had awarded me the Victoria Gold Medal at a time when they were unaware whether I was alive or dead, and when the success of my expedition was unknown. End of chapter 66「started on his last journey to Central Africa. I hope, he said, to ascend the Royuma, and shall strive by passing along the northern end of Lake Nyasa and round the southern egg of Lake Tanganyika to ascertain the watershed of that part of Africa. Arrived at Zanzibar in January 1866, he reached the mouth of the Royuma River some two months later, and passing through dense thickets of trees, he started on his march along the northern bank. The expedition consisted of thirteen sepoys from Bombay, nine negroes from one of the missions, two men from the Zambezi, Susi, Amoda, and others originally slaves, freed by Livingstone. As beasts of burden, they had six camels, three Indian buffaloes, two mules, four donkeys, while a poodle, took charge of the whole line of march, running to see the first man in the line, and then back to the last, and barking to hasten him up. Now that I am on the point of starting on another trip into Africa, wrote Livingstone from Royuma Bay, I feel quite exhilarated. The mere animal pleasure of travelling in a wild, unexplored country is very great. Brisk exercise imparts elasticity to the muscles, Fresh and healthy blood circulates through the brain. The mind works well, the eye is clear, the step firm, and a day's exertion makes the evening's repose thoroughly enjoyable. But misfortunes soon began. As they marched along the banks of the Royuma, the buffaloes and camels were badly bitten by the tsetse fly, and one after another died. The cruelty of the followers to the animals was terrible. Indeed, they were thoroughly unsatisfactory. One day a party of them lagged behind, killed the last young buffalo and ate it. They told Livingstone that it had died, and tigers had come and devoured it. Did you see the stripes of the tiger? asked Livingstone. Yes, all declared that they had seen them distinctly. An obvious lie, as there are no striped tigers in Africa. On 11th of August, Livingstone once more reached Lake Nyasa. It was as if I had come back to an old home I never expected again to see, and pleasant it was to bathe in the delicious waters again. I feel quite exhilarated. Having sent word to the Arab chief of Kota Kota on the opposite coast, and having received no reply to his request to be ferried across the lake, he started off, and marched by land round the southern end, crossing the Shire River at its entrance. He continued his journey round the southwestern gulf of Lake Nyasa, till rumors of Zulu raids frightened his men. They refused to go any farther, but just threw down their loads and walked away. He was now left with Susie and Chuma, and a few boys with whom he crossed the end of a long range of mountains, over four thousand feet in height, and pursuing a zigzag track, reached the Long River on 16th December, 1866, while his unfaithful followers returned to the coast to spread the story that Livingstone had been killed by the Zulus. Meanwhile the explorer was plodding on towards Lake Tanganyika. 
The beauty of the way strikes the lonely explorer. The rainy season had come on in all its force, and the land was wonderful in its early green. Many gay flowers peep out. Here and there the scarlet lily, red-yellow and pure white orchids, and pale lobelias. As we ascended higher on the plateau, grasses which have pink and reddish-brown seed vessels were grateful to the eye. Two disasters clouded this month of travel. His poor poodle was drowned in a marsh, and his medicine chest was stolen. The land was famine-bound, too. The people were living on mushrooms and leaves. We get some elephant's meat, but it is very bitter, and the appetite in this country is always very keen, and makes hunger worse to bear, the want of salt probably making the gnawing sensation worse. On 28th of January, Livingstone crossed the Chambezi, which may almost be regarded as the upper waters of the Congo, says Johnstone, though the explorer of 1867 knew it not. Northwards, says Livingstone, through almost trackless forest and across oozing bogs. And then he adds the significant words, I am frightened at my own emaciation. March finds him worse. I have been ill of fever. Every step I take jars in my chest, and I am very weak. I can scarcely keep up the march. At last, on 1st of April, blue water loomed through the trees. It was Lake Tanganyika, lying some two thousand feet below them. Its surpassing loveliness struck Livingstone. It lies in a deep basin, he says, whose sides are nearly perpendicular, but covered well with trees, at present all green. Down some of these rocks come beautiful cascades, while buffaloes, elephants, and antelopes wander and graze on the more level spots, and lions roar by night. In the morning and evening, huge crocodiles may be observed, quietly making their way to their feeding grounds, and hippopotami snort by night. Going westwards, Livingstone met a party of Arabs, amongst whom he remained for over three months, till he could make his way on to Lake Meoro, reported to be only three days' journey. It took him sixteen days to reach it. Lake Meoro seems of goodly size, he says, and is flanked by ranges of mountains on the east and west. Its banks are of coarse sand and slope gradually down to the water. We slept in a fisherman's cottage on the north shore. After a stay of six weeks in the neighborhood, Livingstone returned to the Arabs, until the spring of 1868, when he decided to explore the Lake Bangweolo. In spite of opposition and the desertion of more men, he started with five attendants and reached this, one of the largest of the Central African lakes, in July. Modestly enough he asserts the fact. On the 18th I saw the shores of the lake for the first time. The name Bangweolo is applied to the great mass of water, though I fear that our English folks will boggle at it, or call it Bungee Hollow. The water is of a deep sea-green color. It was bitterly cold from the amount of moisture in the air. This moisture converted the surrounding country into one huge bog or sponge, twenty-nine of which Livingstone had to cross in thirty miles, each taking about half an hour to cross. The explorer was still greatly occupied on the problem of the Nile. The discovery of the sources of the Nile, he says, is somewhat akin in importance to the discovery of the Northwest Passage. It seemed to him not impossible that the great river he found, flowing through these two great lakes, to the west of Tanganyika, might prove to be the Upper Nile. It was December before he started for Tanganyika. The new year of 1868 opened badly. Halfway he became very ill. He was constantly wet through, he persistently crossed brooks and rivers, wading through cold water up to his waist. Very ill all over, he enters in his diary. Cannot walk. Pneumonia of right lung. And I cough all day and all night. I am carried several hours a day on a frame. The sun is vertical, blistering any part of the skin exposed. 
and I try to shelter my face and head as well as I can with a bunch of leaves. On 14th of February, 1869, he arrived on the western shores of the lake, and after the usual delay he was put into a canoe for Ujiji. Though better, he was still very ill, and we get the pathetic entry, Hope to hold out to Ujiji. At last he reached the Arab settlement on the eastern shores, where he found the goods sent to him overland from Zanzibar, and though much had been stolen, yet warm clothes, tea, and coffee soon revived him. After a stay of three months he grew better, and turned westwards for the land of the Manyuema, and the great rivers reported to be flowing there. He was guided by Arabs whose trade route extended to the great Lualaba River, in the very heart of Africa, some thousand miles west of Zanzibar. It was an unknown land, unvisited by Europeans, when Livingstone arrived with his Arab escort at Bambarra in September 1869. Being now well rested, he enters in his diary, I resolved to go west to Olualaba and buy a canoe for its exploration. The Manuema country is all surpassingly beautiful. Palms crown the highest heights of the mountains, and the forests about five miles broad are indescribable. Climbers of cable size in great numbers are hung among the gigantic trees. Many unknown wild fruits abound, some the size of a child's head, and strange birds and monkeys are everywhere. With the Arab caravan he traveled almost incessantly zigzagging, through the wonderful Manuema country, until, after a year's wandering, he finally reached the banks of the Lualaba, Congo, on 31st of March, 1871. It was a red-letter day in his life. I went down, he says, to take a good look at the Lualaba here. It is a mighty river at least three thousand yards broad and always deep. The banks are steep, the current is about two miles an hour away to the north. Livingstone was gazing at the second largest river in the world, the Congo, but he thought it was the Nile, and confidently relates how it overflows all its banks annually, as the Nile does. At Nyangwe, a Manuema village, Livingstone stayed for four months. The natives were dreadful cannibals, he saw one day a man with ten human jawbones hung by a string over his shoulder, the owners of which he had killed and eaten. Another day a terrible massacre took place, arising from a squabble over a fowl, in which some four hundred perished. The Arabs too disgusted him with their slave raiding, and he decided that he could no longer travel under their protection. So on 20th of July, 1871, he started back for Ujiji, and after a journey of seven hundred miles, accomplished in three months, he arrived, reduced to a skeleton, only to find that the rascal who had charge of his stores had stolen the whole and made away. But when health and spirit were failing, help was at hand. The meeting of Stanley and Livingstone on the shores of the Lake Tanganyika is one of the most thrilling episodes in the annals of discovery. Let them tell their own story. When my spirits were at their lowest ebb, says Livingstone, one morning Susie came running at the top of his speed and gasped out, An Englishman, I see him! And off he darted to meet him. The American flag at the head of a caravan told of the nationality of the stranger. Bales of goods, bales of tin, huge kettles and cooking pots made me think, this must be a luxurious traveller, and not one at his wit's end, like me. It was Henry Morton Stanley, the travelling correspondent of the New York Herald, sent at an expense of more than four thousand pounds to obtain accurate information about Dr. Livingstone, if living, and if dead, to bring home his bones. And now Stanley takes up the story. He has entered Ujiji and heard from the faithful Susie that the explorer yet lives. Pushing back the crowds of natives, Stanley advanced down, a living avenue of people, till he came to where the white man, with the long grey beard, was standing. As I advanced slowly towards him, says Stanley, 
I noticed he was pale, looked worried, wore a bluish cap with a faded gold band round it, had on a red-sleeved waistcoat, and a pair of great weed trousers. I walked deliberately to him, took off my hat, and said, Dr. Livingstone, I presume. Yes, said he, with a kind smile, lifting his cap slightly. Then we both grasp hands, and I say aloud, I thank God, doctor. I have been permitted to see you. You have brought me new life, new life, murmured the tired explorer, and for the next few days it was enough for the two Englishmen to sit on the mud veranda of Livingstone's house, talking. Livingstone soon grew better, and November found the two explorers surveying the river, flowing from the north of Tanganyika, and deciding that it was not the Nile. Stanley now did his best to persuade Livingstone to return home with him, to recruit his shattered health before finishing his work of exploration. But the explorer, tired and out of health, though he was, utterly refused. He must complete the exploration of the sources of the Nile before he sought that peace and comfort at home for which he must have yearned. So the two men parted, Stanley to carry Livingstone's news of the discovery of the Congo back to Europe, Livingstone to end his days on the lonely shores of Lake Pangveolo, leaving the long-sought mystery of the Nile sources yet unsolved. On 25th of August, 1872, he started on his last journey. He had a well-equipped expedition sent up by Stanley from the coast, including sixty men, donkeys, and cows. He embarked on his fresh journey, with all his old eagerness and enthusiasm, but a few days' travel showed him how utterly unfit he was for any more hardships. He suffered from intense and growing weakness, which increased day by day. He managed somehow to ride his donkey, but in November his donkey died, and he struggled along on foot. Descending into marshy regions north of Lake Bangveolo, his journey became really terrible. The rainy season was at its height, the land was an endless swamp, and starvation threatened the expedition. To add to the misery of the party, there were swarms of mosquitoes, poisonous spiders, and stinging ants by the way. Still, amid all the misery and suffering, the explorer made his way on through the dreary autumn months. Christmas came and went. The new year of 1873 dawned. He could not stop. April found him only just alive, carried by his faithful servants. Then comes the last entry in his diary, 27th of April. Knocked up quite. We are on the banks of Ermolialamo. They laid him at last in a native hut, and here one night he died alone. They found him in the early morning, just kneeling by the side of the rough bed, his body stretched forward, his head buried in his hands upon the pillow. The negroes buried his heart on the spot where he died, in the village of Ilala, on the shores of Lake Bangveolo, under the shadow of a great tree, in the still forest. Then they wrapped his body in a cylinder of bark, bound round in a piece of old sailcloth, lashed it to a pole, and a little band of negroes, including Susie and Chuma, set out to carry their dead master to the coast. For hundreds of miles they tramped with their precious burden, till they reached the sea, and could give it safely to his fellow countrymen, who conveyed it to England, to be laid with other great men in Westminster Abbey. He needs no epitaph to guard a name, which men shall praise while worthy work is done. He lived and died for good, be that his fame. Let marble crumble, this is living stone. End of chapter 67「of a book of discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter 68. Through the Dark Continent. The death of Livingstone, the faithfulness of his native servants in carrying his body and journals across hundreds of miles of wild country to the coast, his discovery of the great river in the heart of Africa, and the great service in Westminster Abbey roused public interest in the dark continent and the unfinished work of the great explorer. Never had such an outburst of missionary zeal been known, never did the cause of geographical exploration receive such an impetus. The dramatic meeting between Livingstone and Stanley on the shores of Lake Tanganyika in 1871 had impressed the public in England and America, and an expedition was now planned by the proprietors of two great newspapers, the London Daily Telegraph and the New York Herald. Stanley was chosen to command it, and perhaps there is hardly a better known book of modern travels than Through the Dark Continent, in which he has related all his adventures and discoveries with regard to the Congo. Leaving England in August 1874 with three Englishmen and a large boat in eight sections, the Lady Alice, for the navigation of lake and river, the little exploring party reached Zanzibar a few weeks later and started on their great inland journey. The way to Victoria Nyanza lay through what is now known as German East Africa. They reached Ugogo safely and turned to the northwest, entering an immense and silent bush field where no food was obtainable. On the eighth day five people died of starvation, and the rest of the expedition was only saved by the purchase of some grain from a distant village. But four more died, and twenty-eight miles under a hot sun prostrated one of the white men, who died a few days later. Thus they entered Ituru, a land of naked people, whose hills drained into marsh, whence issue the southernmost waters of the Nile. Here they were surrounded by angry savages on whom they had to fire, and from whose country they were glad to escape. On the 27th of February, 1875, after tramping for 103 days, they arrived at their destination. One of the white men, who was striding forward, suddenly waved his hat, and with a beaming face shouted out, I have seen the lake, sir, it is grand. Here, indeed, was the Victoria Nyanza, which a dazzling sun transformed into silver, discovered by Speak sixteen years before, and supposed to be the source of the Nile. The men struck up a song in triumph. Sing, O friends, sing, the journey is ended. Sing aloud, O friends, sing to the great Nyanza. Sing all, sing loud, O friends, sing to the great sea. Give your last look to the lands behind, and then turn to the sea. Lift up your heads, O men, and gaze around. Try, if you can, to see its end. See it stretches moons away, this great, sweet, fresh-water sea. I thought, says Stanley, there could be no better way of settling, once and for ever, the vexed question than by circumnavigating the lake. So the Lady Alice was launched, and from the shores of Speak Gulf, as he named the southern end, the explorer set forth, leaving the two remaining Englishmen in charge of the camp. The sky is gloomy, writes Stanley. The rocks are bare and rugged. The land silent and lonely. The rowing of the people is that of men who think they are bound to certain death. Their hearts are full of misgivings, as slowly we move through the dull, dead waters. The waters were not dead for long. A gale rose up, and the lake became wild beyond description. The waves hissed as we tore along, the crew collapsed and crouched into the bottom of the boat, expecting the end of the wild venture. But the Lady Alice bounded forward like a wild courser, and we floated into a bay, still as a pond. So they coasted along the shores of the lake. Their guides told them it would take years to sail round their sea, that on the shores dwelt people with long tails, who preferred to feed on human beings rather than cattle or goats. But... Undaunted, the explorer sailed on, across the Napoleon Channel, 
through which flowed the superfluous waters of the lake, rushing northward as the Victorian Isle. On the western side of the channel is Uganda, dominated by an emperor, who is supreme over about three millions of people. He soon heard of my presence on the lake, and dispatched a flotilla to meet me. His mother had dreamed the night before that she had seen a boat sailing, sailing like a fish-eagle over the Nyanza. In the stern of the boat was a white man, gazing wistfully towards Uganda. On reaching the port, a crowd of soldiers, arrayed in crimson and black and snowy white, were drawn up to receive him. As we neared the beach, volleys of musketry burst out from the long lines. Numerous kettles and brass drums sounded a noisy welcome, flags and banners waved, and the people gave a great shout. Such was Stanley's welcome to Mtsesa's wonderful kingdom of Uganda, described by Speak sixteen years before. The twelve days spent at the court of this monarch impressed Stanley deeply. Specially was the king interested in Christianity, and the English explorer told the story of the creation and the birth of the Messiah to this intelligent pagan and his courtiers. Ten days after we left the genial court, I came upon the scene of the tragedy. We were coasting the eastern side of a large island, having been thirty-six hours without food, looking for a port where we could put in and purchase provisions. Natives followed our movements, poising their spears, stringing their bows, picking out the best rocks for their slings. We were thirteen souls, they between three and four hundred. Seeing the boat advance, they smiled, entered the water, and held out inviting hands. The crew shot the boat towards the natives. Their hands closed on her firmly. They ran with her to the shore, and dragged her high and dry about twenty yards from the lake. Then ensued a scene of rampant wildness and hideous ferocity of action beyond description. The boat was surrounded by a forest of spears, and two hundred demons contended for the first blow. I sprang up to kill and be killed, a revolver in each hand. But as I rose to my feet, the utter hopelessness of our situation was revealed to me. To make a long story short, the natives seized the oars, and sinking the boat was now in their power, they retired to make their plans. Meanwhile, Stanley commanded his crew to tear the bottom boards up for paddles, and pushing the boat hastily into the water, they paddled away, their commander firing the while with his elephant rifle and explosive bullets. They were saved. On 6th of May, the circumnavigation was finished, and the Lady Alice was being dragged ashore in Speak Gulf with shouts of welcome and the waving of many flags. But sad news awaited him. He could see but one of his white companions. "'Where is Barker?' he asked Frank Pocock. "'He died twelve days ago,' was the melancholy answer. Stanley now took his whole expedition to Uganda, and after spending some months with the king, he passed on to Lake Tanganyika, crossing to Ujiji, where he arrived in May, 1876. Here, five years before, he had found Livingstone. We launched our boat on the lake, and circumnavigating it, discovered that there was only a periodical outlet to it. Thus, by the circumnavigation of the two lakes, two of the geographical problems I had undertaken to solve were settled. The Victoria Nyanza had no connection with the Tanganyika. There now remained the grandest task of all. Is the Lualaba, which Livingstone had traced along a course of nearly thirteen hundred miles, the Nile, the Niger, or the Congo? I crossed Lake Tanganyika with my expedition, lifted once more my gallant boat on our shoulders, and after a march of nearly two hundred and twenty miles, arrived at the superb river. Where I first sighted it, the Lualaba was fourteen hundred yards wide, pale grey in colour, winding slowly from south and by east. We hailed its appearance with shouts of joy, and rested on the spot to enjoy the view. I likened it to the Mississippi, as it appears before the impetuous, full-volumed Missouri pours its rusty brown water into it. A secret rapture filled my soul as I gazed upon the majestic stream. 
the great mystery that for all these centuries nature had kept hidden away from the world of science was waiting to be solved. For two hundred and twenty miles I had followed the sources of the Livingstone River to the confluence, and now before me lay the superb river itself. My task was to follow it to the ocean. Pressing on along the river, they reached the Arab city of Niangwe, having accomplished three hundred and thirty-eight miles in forty-three days. And now the famous Arab Tipu Tib comes on the scene, a chief with whom Stanley was to be closely connected hereafter. He was a tall, black-bearded man, with an intelligent face and gleaming white teeth. He wore clothes of spotless white. His face was smart and new, his dagger resplendent with silver filigree. He had escorted Cameron across the river to the south, and he now confirmed Stanley in his idea that the greatest problem of African geography, the discovery of the course of the Congo, was still untouched. This was momentous and all-important news to the expedition. We had arrived at the critical point in our travels, remarked Stanley. What kind of a country it is to the north along the river, he asked. Monstrous bad, was the reply. There are large boa constrictors in the forest, suspended by their tails, waiting to gobble up travelers. You cannot travel without being covered by ants, and they sting like wasps. There are leopards in countless numbers. Gorillas hound the woods. The people are man-eaters. A party of three hundred guns started for the forest, and only sixty returned. Stanley and his last remaining white companion, Frank Pocock, discussed the somewhat alarming situation together. Should they go on and face the dwarfs who shot with poisoned arrows, the cannibals who regarded the stranger as so much meat, the cataracts and rocks, should they follow the great river which flowed northward for ever and knew no end? This great river which Livingstone first saw, and which broke his heart to turn away from, is a noble field, argued Stanley. After buying or building canoes and floating down the river day by day, either to the Nile or to some vast lake in the far north or to the Congo and the Atlantic Ocean. Let us follow the river, replied the white man. So, accompanied by Tipu Tib, with a hundred and forty guns and seventy spearmen, they started along the banks of the river, which Stanley now named the Livingstone River. On the 5th of November, 1876, said Stanley, a force of about seven hundred people, consisting of Tipu Tib's slaves and my expedition, departed from the town of Nyangwe and entered the dismal forest land north. A straight line from this point to the Atlantic Ocean would measure 1,070 miles. Another to the Indian Ocean would measure only 920 miles. We had not reached the center of the continent by 75 miles. Outside the woods blazed a blinding sunshine. Underneath that immense roof foliage was a solemn twilight. The trees shed continual showers of tropic dew. As we struggled on through the mud, the perspiration exuded from every pore. Our clothes were soon wet and heavy. Every man had to crawl and scramble as he best could. Sometimes prostrate forest giants barred the road with a mountain of twigs and branches. For ten days we endured it. Then the Arabs declared they could go no farther. I promised them five hundred pounds if they would escort us twenty marches only. On our way to the river we came to a village whose sole street was adorned with 186 human skulls. Seventeen days from Nyangwe we saw again the great river, and viewing the stately breadth of the mighty stream, I resolved to launch my boat for the last time. Placing thirty-six of the people in the boat, we floated down the river close to the bank along which the land party marched. Day after day passed on, and we found the natives increasing in wild rancor and unreasoning hate of strangers. At every curve and bend they telephoned along the river warning signals. Their huge wooden drums sounded the muster for fierce resistance. Reed arrows tipped with poison were shot at us from the jungle as we glided by. On the 18th of December our miseries culminated, 
in the grand effort of the savages to annihilate us. The cannibals had manned the topmost branches of the trees above the village of Binyanyara to shoot at us. A camp was hastily constructed by Stanley in defense, and for several days there was desperate fighting, at the end of which peace was made. But Tipu Tib and his escort refused to go a step farther to what they felt was certain destruction. Stanley alone was determined to proceed. He bought thirty-three native canoes, and leaving with the Lady Alice, he set his face towards the unknown country. His men were all sobbing. They leaned forward, bowed with grief and heavy hearts at the prospect before them. Dense woods covered both banks and islands. Savages with gaily feathered heads and painted faces dashed out of the woods, armed with shields and spears, shouting, Meat! Meat! Ha! Ha! We shall have plenty of meat! Armies of parrots screamed overhead as they flew across the river. Legions of monkeys and howling baboons alarmed the solitudes. Crocodiles haunted the sandy points. Hippopotami grunted at our approach. Elephants stood by the margin of the river. There was unceasing vibration from millions of insects throughout the lifelong day. The sun shone large and warm. The river was calm and broad and brown. By January 1877, the expedition reached the first cataract of what is now known as the Stanley Falls. From this point, for some sixty miles, the great volume of the Livingstone River rushed through narrow and lofty banks in a series of rapids. For twenty-two days he toiled along the banks, through jungle and forest, over cliffs and rocks, exposed all the while to murderous attacks by cannibal savages till the seventh cataract was passed, and the boats were safely below the falls. We hastened away down river in a hurry, to escape the noise of the cataracts, which for many days and nights had almost stunned us with their deafening sound. We were once more afloat on a magnificent stream, nearly a mile wide, curving northwest. Ha! Is it the Niger or Congo? I said. But day after day, as they dropped downstream, new enemies appeared, until at last, at the junction of the Aruvimi, a tributary as large as the main stream, a determined attack was made on them by some two thousand warriors in large canoes. A monster canoe led the way with two rows of forty paddlers each, their bodies swaying to a barbarous chorus. In the bow were ten prime young warriors, their heads gay with the feathers of the parrot, crimson and grey. At the stern, eight men with long paddles, decorated with ivory balls, guided the boat, while ten chiefs danced up and down from stem to stern. The crashing of large drums, a hundred blasts from ivory horns, and a song from two thousand voices did not tend to assure the little fleet under Stanley. The Englishman coolly anchored his boats in midstream, and received the enemy with such well-directed volleys that the savages were utterly paralyzed, and with great energy they retreated, pursued hotly by Stanley's party. Leaving them wandering and lamenting, I sought the mid-channel again, and wandered on with the current. In the voiceless depths of the watery wilderness we encountered neither treachery nor guile, and we floated down, down, hundreds of miles. The river curved westward, then southwestward, ah, straight for the mouth of the Congo. It widened daily. The channels became numerous. Through the country of the Bangala they now fought their way. These people were armed with guns brought up from the coast by native traders. It was indeed an anxious moment when, with war drums beating, sixty-three beautiful but cruel canoes came skimming towards Stanley, with some three hundred guns to his forty-four. For nearly five hours the two fleets fought, until the victory rested with the American. This, remarks Stanley, was our thirty-first fight on the terrible river, and certainly the most determined conflict we had endured. They rode on till the eleventh of March. The river had grown narrower and steep. Wooden hills rose on either side above them. Suddenly the river expanded, and the voyagers entered a wide basin or pool, 
over thirty square yards. Sandy islands rose in front of us like a sea beach, and on the right, toward a long row of cliffs, white and glistening, like the cliffs of Dover. Why not call it Stanley Pool and those cliffs Dover Cliffs, suggested Frank Pocock, and these names may be seen on our maps today. Passing out of the pool, the roar of a great cataract burst upon their ears. It was the first of a long series of falls and rapids, which continued for a distance of one hundred and fifty-five miles. To this great stretch of cataracts and rapids, Stanley gave the name of the Livingstone Falls. At the fifth cataract, Stanley lost his favorite little native page, boy Kalulu. The canoe in which he was rowing shot suddenly over the rapids, and in the furious whirl of rushing waters, poor little Kalulu was drowned. He had been born a prince and given to Stanley on his first expedition into Africa. Stanley had taken him to Europe and America, and the boy had repaid his kindness by faithful and tender devotion till that fatal day when he went to his death over the wild Livingstone Falls. Stanley named the rapid after him, Kalulu Falls. But a yet more heart-rendering loss was in store for him. Progress was now very slow, for none of the cataracts or rapids could be navigated. Canoes as well as stores had to be dragged over land from point to point. Frank Pocock had fallen lame and could not walk with the rest. Although accidents with the canoes were of daily occurrence, although he might have taken warning by the death of Kalulu, he insisted that his crew should try to shoot the great Masasa Falls instead of going round by land. Too late he realized his danger. The canoe was caught by the rushing tide, flung over the falls, tossed from wave to wave, and finally dragged into the swirling whirlpool below. The little master, as he was called, was never seen again. Stanley's last white companion was gone. Gloom settled down on the now painfully reduced party. We are all unnerved with the terrible accident of yesterday, says Stanley, as I looked at the dejected, woe-stricken servants. A choking sensation of unutterable grief filled me. This four months had we lived together, and true had been his service. The servant had long ago merged into the companion. The companion had become the friend. Still Stanley persevered in his desperate task, and in spite of danger from cataracts and danger from famine, on 31st of July he reached the Izangila cataract. Thus far, in 1816, two explorers had made their way from the ocean, and Stanley knew now for certain that he was on the mighty Congo. He saw no reason to follow it farther, or to toil through the last four cataracts. I therefore announced to the gallant but wearied followers that we should abandon the river and strike overland for Boma, the nearest European settlement, some sixty miles across country. At sunset on 31st of July, they carried the Lady Alice to the summit of some rocks above the Isangila Falls, and abandoned her to her fate. Farewell, brave boat, cried Stanley. Seven thousand miles up and down broad Africa, thou hast accompanied me. For over five thousand miles thou hast been my home. Lift her up tenderly, boys, so tenderly, and let her rest. Then... Wayworn and feeble, half-starved, diseased and suffering, the little caravan of one hundred and fifteen men, women and children, started on their overland march to the coast. Staggering, we arrived at Boma on ninth of August, 1877. A gathering of European merchants met me, and smiling a warm welcome, told me kindly that I had done right well. Three days later I gazed upon the Atlantic Ocean, and saw the powerful river flowing into the bosom of that boundless, endless sea. But grateful as I felt to him, who had enabled me to pierce the dark continent from east to west, my heart was charged with grief, and my eyes with tears at the thought of the many comrades and friends I had lost. The price paid had indeed been great. He had lost his three English companions, and one hundred and seventy natives besides. 
but for years and years to come, in many a home at Zanzibar, whither Stanley now took his party by sea, the story of his great journey was told, and all the men were heroes, and the refrain of the natives was chanted again and again. Then sing, O friends, sing, the journey is ended. Sing aloud, O friends, sing to this great sea. Stanley had solved the problem of the Congo River at last. End of chapter 68「Chapter sixty nine of a Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter sixty nine. Nordenskjold accomplishes the Northeast Passage. The Northwest Passage for the accomplishment of which so many brave lives had been laid down, had been discovered. It now remained for some explorer to sail round the north-east passage, which was known to exist, but which, up to this time, no man had done. Nordenskjold, the Swede, was to have this honour. Born in 1832 in Finland, he had taken part in the Arctic expedition in 1861, which attempted to reach the North Pole by means of dog sledges from the north coast of Spitsbergen. Three years later, he was appointed to lead an expedition to Spitsbergen, which succeeded in reaching the highest northern latitude which any ship had yet attained. In 1870, his famous journey to Greenland took place, and two years later he left Sweden on another polar expedition. But misfortunes beset the expedition, and finally the ships were wrecked. The following year he commanded a reconnoitring expedition. He passed Nova Zemlya and reached the mouth of the Yenisei. This was the first time that a ship had accomplished the voyage from the Atlantic Ocean. Thus Nordenskjold had gained considerable knowledge of the northern seas, and he was now in a position to lay a plan of his schemes before King Oscar, who had always interested himself in Arctic discovery. His suggestions to the king are of singular interest. It is my intention, he says, to leave Sweden in July 1878 in a steamer specially built for navigation among ice, which will be provisioned for two years at most. The course will be shaped for Nova Zemlya, where a favorable opportunity will be awaited for the passage of the Kara Sea. The voyage will be continued to the mouth of the Yenisei, which I hope to reach in the first half of August. As soon as circumstances permit, the expedition will continue its voyage along the coast of Cape Chelyuskin, where the expedition will reach the only part of the proposed route which has not been traversed by some small vessel, and is rightly considered as that which it will be most difficult for a vessel to double during the whole northeast passage. But our vessel, equipped with all modern appliances, ought not to find insuperable difficulties in doubling this point, and if that can be accomplished, we will probably have pretty open water towards Bering Straits, which ought to be reached before the end of September. From Bering Strait the course will be shaped for some Asiatic port, and then onwards round Asia to Suez. King Oscar and others offered to pay the expenses of the expedition, and preparations were urged forward. The Vega, of 800 tons, formerly used in walrus hunting in northern waters, was purchased, and further strengthened to withstand ice. On 22nd of June all was ready, and with the Swedish flag, which a crowned O in the middle, the little Vega, which was to accomplish such great things, was peacefully rocking on the swell of the Baltic, as if impatient to be again her struggle against waves and ice. She carried food for thirty people for two years, which included over three thousand pounds of bacon, nine thousand pounds of coffee, nine thousand pounds of biscuits. There were pemmican from England, potatoes from the Mediterranean, cranberry juice from Finland. Fresh bread was made during the whole expedition, a few days later, the Vega reached Copenhagen and steamed north in the finest weather. 
Where are you bound for? signaled a passing ship. To Bering Sea was the return signal, and the Swedish crew waved their caps, shouting their joyful news. At Gothenburg they took on eight sledges, tents, and cooking utensils, also two Scotch sheep dogs, and a little coal black kitten, which lived in the captain's berth till it grew accustomed to the sea, when it slept in the forecastle by day and ran about stealing the food of the sleeping sailors by night. On 16th July they crossed the polar circle. All on board feel they are entering upon a momentous period of their life, says the explorer. Weary to be the fortunate ones to reach this goal, which navigators for centuries had striven to reach. The southwest coast of Nova Zemlia was reached on 28th of July, but the weather being calm and the sea completely free of ice, Nordeskjold sailed onwards through the Kara Strait, or Iron Gates, which during the winter was usually one sheet of ice, until they anchored outside the village of Khabarova. The village consisted of a few huts and tents of Russian and Samoyedes, pasturing their reindeer on the Vagets Island. On the bleak northern shores stood a little wooden church, which the explorers visited with much interest. It seemed strange to find here brass bas reliefs representing the Christ, St. Nicholas, Elia, St. George and the Dragon, and the Resurrection. In front of each hung a little oil lamp. The people were dressed entirely in reindeer skin, from head to foot, and they had a great collection of walrus tusks and skins, such as Othira had brought centuries before to King Alfred. Nordenskjold's account of a short drive in a reindeer sledge is amusing. Four reindeer were put side by side to each sledge, he says. Ivan, my driver, requested me to hold tight. He held the reins of all four reindeer in one hand, and away we went over the plain. His request to keep myself tight to the sledge was not unnecessary. At one moment the sledge jumped over a big tussock, the next it went down into a pit. It was anything but a comfortable drive, for the pace at which we went was very great. On 1st of August the Vega was off again, and soon she had entered the Kara Sea, known in the days of the Dutch explorers as the Ice Cellar. Then past White Island and the estuary of the Great Obi River, past the mouth of the Yenisei to Dixon Island, lately discovered, she sailed. Here in this best-known haven on the whole north coast of Asia, they anchored and spent time in bear and reindeer hunting. In consequence of the successful sport, we lived very extravagantly during these days. Our table groaned with joints of venison and beer hams. They now sailed north, close bound in fog, till on 20th of August we reached the Great Gaul, which for centuries had been the object of unsuccessful struggles. For the first time a vessel lay at anchor off the northernmost cape of the old world. With colors flying on every mast and saluting the venerable North Point of the old world, with the Swedish salute of five guns, we came to an anchor. The fog lifting for a moment, they saw a white polar bear standing, regarding the unexpected guests with surprise. When afterwards a member of the expedition was asked which moment was the proudest of the whole voyage, he answered without hesitation, undoubtedly the moment when we anchored off Cape Chelyuskin. It had been named thus by the Great Northern Expedition in 1742 after Lieutenant Chelyuskin, one of the Russian explorers under Laptev, who had reached this northern point by a land journey which had entailed terrible hardships and suffering. Next morning, relates Nordenskjold, we erected a cairn on the shore, and in the middle of it laid a tin box with the following document written in Swedish. The Swedish Arctic expedition arrived here yesterday, the 19th of August, and proceeds in a few hours eastward. The sea has been tolerably free from ice, sufficient supply of coals, all well on board. And below in English and Russian were the words, Please forward this document as soon as possible to His Majesty the King of Sweden. Nordenskjold now attempted to steam eastwards towards the new Siberian islands, but the fog was thick 
and they fell in with large ice floes, which soon gave place to ice fields. Violent snowstorms soon set in, and aloft everything was covered with a crust of ice, and the position in the crow's nest was anything but pleasant. They reached Katanga Bay, however, and on 27th August the Vega was at the mouth of the Lena. We were now in hopes that we should be in Japan in a couple of months. We had accomplished two-thirds of our way through the Polar Sea, and the remaining third had been often navigated at different distances. So the Vega sailed on eastwards, with an ice-free sea, to the new Siberian islands, where lie embedded enormous masses of the bones and tusks of the mammoth, mixed with the horns and skulls of some kind of ox, and with the horns of rhinoceros. All was still clear of snow, and the new Siberian islands laying long and low in the polar seas were safely passed. It was not till the first of September that the first snows fell. The decks of the Vega were white with snow when the Bear Island were reached. Fog now hindered the expedition once more, and ice was sighted. Ice right ahead, suddenly shouted the watch on the forecastle, and only by a hair's breadth was the Vega saved. On 3rd of September a thick snowstorm came on. The bare islands were covered with newly fallen snow, and though the ice was growing more closely packed than any yet encountered, they could still make their way along a narrow, ice-free channel near the coast. Snowstorms, fog, and drifting ice compelled careful navigation, but a pleasant change occurred early in September by a visit from the natives. We have already heard of the Chukches from Bering, the Chukches whom no man had yet vanquished, for when Siberia was conquered by a Cossack chief in 1579, the Chukches in this outlaying northeastern corner of the old world, savage, courageous, resolute, kept the conquerors at bay. For the last six weeks the explorers had not seen a human being on that wild and desolate stretch of coast, so they were glad enough to see the little Chukches, with their coal-black hair and eyes, their large mouths and flat noses. Although it was only five o'clock in the morning, we all jumped out of our berths and hurried on deck to see these people of whom so little was known. The boats were of skin, fully laden with laughing and chattering natives, men, women, and children, who indicated by cries and gesticulations that they wished to come on board. The engine was stopped, the boats lay to, and a large number of skin-clad, bare-headed beings climbed up over the gunwale, and a lively talk began. Great gladness prevailed when tobacco and Dutch clay pipes were distributed among them. None of them could speak a word of Russian, they had come in closer contact with American whalers than with Russian traders. The Chukchis were all very short and dressed in reindeer skins, with tight-fitting trousers of sealskin, shoes of reindeer skin with sealskin boots and walrus skin soles. In very cold weather they wore hoods of wolf fur, with the head of the wolf at the back. But Nordenskjold could not wait long. Amid snow and ice and fog he pushed on, hoping against hope to get through to the Pacific before the sea was completely frozen over. But the ice was beginning to close. Large blocks were constantly hurled against the ship with great violence, and she had many a narrow escape of destruction. At last, it was 28th of September, the little Vega was finally and hopelessly frozen into the ice, and they made her fast to a large ice block. Sadly, we find the entry. Only one hundred and twenty miles distant from our goal, which we had been approaching during the last two months, and after having accomplished two thousand four hundred miles, it took some time before we could accustom ourselves to the thought that we were so near, and yet so far from our destination. Fortunately, they were near the shore and the little settlement of Pitlekai, where in eight tents dwelt a party of Chukches. These little people helped them to pass the long, monotonous winter, and many an expedition inland was made in chuck sledges, drawn by eight or ten wolf-like dogs. 
Snowstorms soon burst upon the little party of Swedish explorers, who had made the Vega their winter home. During November we have scarcely had any daylight, writes Nordenskjold. The storm was generally howling in our rigging, which was now enshrouded in a thick coat of snow. The deck was full of large snowdrifts, and snow penetrated into every corner of the ship, where it was possible for the wind to find an opening. If we put our heads outside the door, we were blinded by the drifting snow. Christmas came and was celebrated by a Christmas tree made of willows tied to a flagstaff and the traditional rice porridge. By April, large flocks of geese, either ducks, gulls, and little songbirds began to arrive, the latter perching on the rigging of the vega, but May and June found her still icebound in her winter quarters. It was not till 18th of July, 1879, that the hour of deliverance came at last, and we cast loose from our faithful ice-block, which for 294 days had protected us so well against the pressure of the ice, and stood westwards in the open channel, now about a mile wide. On the shore stood our old friends, probably on the point of crying, which they had often told us they would do when the ship left them. For long the Chukchis stood on the shore, men, women, and children, watching till the fire-dog, as they called the Vega, was out of sight, carrying their white friends forever away from their bleak, inhospitable shores. Passing through closely packed ice, the Vega now rounded the East Cape, of which we now and then caught a glimpse through the fog. As soon as we came out of the ice south of the East Cape, we noticed the heavy swell of the Pacific Ocean. The completion of the Northeast Passage was celebrated the same day with a grand dinner, and the Vega greeted the old and new worlds by a display of flags and the firing of a Swedish salute. Now for the first time after the lapse of 336 years was the Northeast Passage at last achieved. Sailing through the Bering Strait, they anchored near Bering Island on 14th of August. As they came to anchor, a boat shot alongside, and a voice cried out in Swedish, Is it Nordenskjold? A Finland carpenter soon stood in their midst, and they eagerly questioned him about the news from the civilized world. There is no time to tell how the Vega sailed on to Japan, where Nordenskjold was presented to the Mikado, and an imperial medal was struck commemorating the voyage of the Vega, how she sailed right round Asia, through the Suez Canal, and reached Sweden in safety. It was on 24th of April, 1880, that the little weather-beaten Vega, accompanied by flag-decked steamers, literally laden with friends, sailed into the Stockholm harbor, while the hiss of fireworks and the roar of cannon mingled with the shouts of thousands. The royal palace was ablaze with light when King Oscar received and honored the successful explorer Nordenskjold. End of chapter 69「Chapter 70 of a Book of Discovery」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 70 The Exploration of Tibet Perhaps no land in the world has in modern times exercised a greater influence over the imagination of men than the mysterious country of Tibet. From the days of Herodotus to those of young husband, travelers of all times and nations have tried to explore this unknown country, so jealously guarded from Europeans. Surrounded by a great wilderness of stony and inhospitable altitudes, lay the capital, Ulhasa, the seat of the gods, the home of the Grand Lama, founded in 639 A.D., mysterious, secluded, sacred. Kublai Khan, of Marco Polo fame, had annexed Tibet to his vast empire, and in 1720 the mysterious land was finally conquered by the Chinese. The history of the exploration of Tibet and the adjoining country, 
and of the various attempts to penetrate to Lhasa, is one of the most thrilling in the annals of discovery. We remember that Benjamin of Tudela in the 12th century, Carpini and William de Rubruquis in the 13th, all assert that they passed through Tibet, but we have no certain records, till several Italian Capuchin friars succeeded in reaching Lhasa. There they lived and taught for some thirty-eight years, when they were withdrawn, and the little Tibetan mission, as it was called, came to an end. It was yet early in the eighteenth century. England was taking up her great position in India, and Warren Hastings was anxious to open up friendly relations with Tibet beyond the great Himalaya ranges. To this end he sent an Englishman, George Bogle, with these instructions. I desire you will proceed to Lhasa. The design of your mission is to open a mutual and equal communication of trade between the inhabitants of Tibet and Bengal. You will take with you samples for a trial of such articles of commerce as may be sent from this country, and you will diligently inform yourself of the manufactures, productions, and goods which are to be procured in Tibet. The following will also be proper subjects for your inquiry, the nature of the roads between the borders of Bengal and Lhasa, and the neighboring countries. I wish you to remain a sufficient time to obtain a complete knowledge of the country. The period of your stay must be left to your discretion. Bogol was young. He knew nothing of the country. But in May 1774, his little expedition set off from Calcutta to do the bidding of Warren Hastings. By way of Bhutan, planting potatoes at intervals according to his orders, Bogol proceeded across the eastern Himalayas towards the Tibetan frontier, reaching Pfari, the first town in Tibet, at the end of October. Then they reached Gyangtze, a great trade center now open to foreigners, crossed the Brahmaputra, which they found was about the size of Thames at Putney, and reached the residence of the Tashi Lama, the second great potentate of Tibet. This great dignitary and the young Englishman made great friends. On a carved and gilt throne amid cushions sat the lama, cross-legged. He was dressed in a metro-shaped cap of yellow broadcloth with long bars lined with red satin, a yellow cloth jacket without sleeves, and a satin mantle of the same color thrown over his shoulders. On one side of him stood his physician with a bundle of perfumed sandalwood rods, burning in his hand. On the other stood his cup-bearer. Such was this remarkable man, as first seen by the English, venerated as God's vice-regent through all the eastern countries of Asia. He had heard much of the power of the Thuringes, as he called the English. As my business is to pray to God, he said to Bogle, I was afraid to admit any Thuringes into this country but I have since learned that they are a fair and just people. Bogle would have proceeded to Lhasa, the home of the Grand Lama, but this permission was refused, and he had to return to India with the information he had collected. The next Englishman to enter Tibet was Thomas Manning, the first to reach the sacred city of Lhasa. He was a private adventurer who had lived in China and learned the language attended by a Chinese servant, and wearing a flowing bird of singular length, he left Calcutta, crossed into the Bhutan, and arrived at the Tibetan border in October 1811. Then he crossed the Brahmaputra in a large ferry boat, and arrived within seven miles of Lhasa. On 9th December, the first European entered the sacred city since the expulsion of the Capuchin friars. The view of the famous Potala, the lofty towering palace, filled him with admiration. But the city of which Europe, knowing nothing, had exalted into a magnificent place, was very disappointing. We passed under a large gateway, says Manning, whose gilded ornaments were so ill-fixed that some leaned one way and some another. The road, as it winds round the palace, is royally broad. It swarmed with monks, and beggars were basking in the sun. There is nothing striking in its appearance. The habitations are begrimed with smut and dirt. The avenues are full of dogs. In short, 
everything seems mean and gloomy. Having provided himself with a proper hat, Manning went to the Potala to salute the Grand Lama, taking with him a pair of brass candlesticks, with two wax candles, some genuine Smith's lavender water, and a good store of nankin tea, which is a rare delicacy at Lhasa. Ushered into the presence of the Grand Lama, a child of seven, he touched his head three times on the floor, after the custom of the country, and taking off his hat, kneeled to be blessed by the little monarch. He had the simple and unaffected manners of a well-educated princely child. His face was affectingly beautiful. His beautiful mouth was perpetually unbending into a graceful smile, which illuminated his whole countenance. Here Manning spent four months, at the end of which time he was recalled from Pekin, and reluctantly he was obliged to return the way he came. The next man to reach the forbidden city was a Jesuit missionary, the Abbe Huk, who reached Lhasa in 1846 from China. He had adopted the dress of the Tibetan Lama, the yellow cap and gown, and he piloted his little caravan across the wide steps on horseback, while his fellow missionary, Gabet, rode a camel, and their one Tartar retainer rode a black mule. It took them a year and a half to reach the sacred city of Lhasa, for many and great were the difficulties on the way. The first difficulty lay in crossing the Yellow River, which was in flood. It is quite impossible to cross the Yellow River, they were told. Eight days ago the river overflowed its banks, and the plains are completely flooded. The Tartars only told us the truth, remarked Huck sadly. The Yellow River had become a vast sea, the limits of which were scarcely visible. Houses and villages looked as though they were floating upon the waves. What were we to do? To turn back was out of the question. We had vowed that, God willing, we would go to Lhasa, whatever obstacles impeded. And so they did. The camels were soon up to their knees in a thick, slimy compost of mud and water, over which the poor animals slid on their painful way. Their courage was rewarded. Native ferry boats came to their rescue, and they reached the other side in safety. They were now on the main caravan route to the Tibetan frontier and the Kokonor. Immense caravans were met, with strings of camels extending four miles in length. Three times between the Yellow River and the Kokonor lake did they pass the Great Wall, built in 214 A.D. After over four months of travel, Hak arrived at the monastery of Kunkum, on the borderland of Tibet. This was the home of four thousand lamas, all clothed in red dresses and yellow mitres, and thither resorted the worshippers of Buddha, from all parts of Tartary and Tibet. The site is one of enchanting beauty, says Hok. Imagine in a mountainside a deep, broad ravine, adorned with fine trees and alive, with the caving of rooks and yellow-beaked crows, and the amusing chatter of magpies. On the two sides of the ravine and on the slopes of the mountain rise the white dwellings of the lamas. Amid the dazzling whiteness of these modest habitations rise numerous Buddhist temples, with gilt roofs, sparkling with a thousand brilliant colors. Here the travelers stayed for three months, after which they made their way on to the Coconor Lake. As we advanced, says Hook, the country became more fertile, until we reached the vast and magnificent pasturage of Coconor. Here vegetation is so vigorous that the grass rose up to the stomachs of our camels. Soon we discovered far before us what seemed a broad silver ribbon. Our leader informed us that this was the Blue Sea. We urged on our animals, and the sun had not set when we planted our tent within a hundred paces of the waters of the great blue lake. This immense reservoir of waters seems to merit the title of sea rather than merely of a lake. To say nothing of its vast extent, its waters are bitter and salt, like those of the ocean. After a month spent on the shores of the blue lake, an opportunity offered for the advance. Towards the end of October, they found that an embassy from Ulhasa to Pekin was returning in great force. 
This would afford Huck and his companion safe travelling from the hordes of brigands that infested the route through Tibet. The caravan was immense. There were fifteen hundred oxen, twelve hundred horses, and as many camels and about two thousand men. The ambassador was carried in a litter. Such was the multitude which now started for the thousand miles across Tibet to Lhasa. After crossing the great Burkhan Buddha range, the caravan came to the Shuga Pass, about seventeen thousand feet high, and here their troubles began. When the huge caravan first set itself in motion, says Hock, the sky was clear, and the brilliant moon lit up the great carpet of snow with which the whole country was covered. We were able to attain the summit by sunrise. Then the sky became thickly overcast with clouds, and the wind began to blow, with a violence which became more and more intense. Snow fell heavily, and several animals perished. They marched in the teeth of an icy wind, which almost choked them. Whirlwinds of snow blinded them, and when they reached the foot of the mountain at last, Mr. Gabet found that his nose and ears were frostbitten. As they proceeded, the cold became more intense. The demons of snow, wind, and cold were set loose on the caravan with a fury which seemed to increase from day to day. One cannot imagine a more terrible country, says poor Huck. Not only were the animals dying from cold and exposure, but men were beginning to drop out and die. Forty of the party died before the plateau of Tangla had been crossed, a proceeding which lasted twelve days. The track, some sixteen thousand feet above the sea, was bordered by the skeletons of mules and camels, and monstrous eagles followed the caravan. The scenery was magnificent. Line upon line of snow-white pinnacles stretched southward and westward under a bright sun. The descent was long, brusque and rapid, like the descent of a gigantic ladder. At the lower altitude snow and ice disappeared. It was the end of January, 1846, when at last our two travellers found themselves approaching the longed-for city of Lhasa. The sun was nearly setting, says Hook, when we found ourselves in a vast plain and saw on our right Lhasa, the famous metropolis of the Buddhist world. After eighteen months' struggle with sufferings and obstacles of infinite number and variety, we were at length arrived at the termination of our journey, though not at the close of our miseries. Huck's account of the city agrees well with that of Manning. The palace of the Dalai Lama, he says, merits the celebrity which it enjoys throughout the world. Upon a rugged mountain, the mountain of Buddha, the adorers of the Lama have raised the magnificent palace wherein their living divinity resides in the flesh. This place is made up of various temples. That which occupies the center is four stories high. It terminates in a dome entirely covered with plates of gold. It is here the Dalai Lama has set up his abode. From the summit of his lofty sanctuary, he can contemplate his innumerable adorers prostrate at the foot of the divine mountain. But in the town all was different. All are engaged in the grand business of buying and selling, all is noise, pushing, excitement, confusion. Here Huck and his companion resided for two and a half months, opening an oratory in their house, and even making a few Christian converts. But soon they were ordered to leave, and reluctantly they travelled back to China, though by a somewhat different route. After this, the Tibetans guarded their capital more zealously than before. Przewalski, that grand explorer of Russian nationality, spent years in exploring Tibet, but when within a hundred and sixty miles of Lhasa, he was stopped, and never reached the forbidden city. Others followed. Prince Henry of Orleans got to within one hundred miles of Lhasa, Little Dale and his wife to within fifty miles. Sven Hedin, the prince of Swedish explorers, who had made so many famous journeys around and about Tibet, was making a dash for the capital, disguised as a Mongolian pilgrim, when he too was stopped. A long black line of Tibetan horsemen rode towards us at full gallop, he relates. It was not raining just at that moment. 
till there was nothing to prevent us from witnessing what was in truth a very magnificent spectacle. It was as though a living avalanche were sweeping down upon us. A moment more and we should be annihilated. We held our weapons ready. On came the Tibetans in a one long line stretching across the plain. We counted close upon seventy in all. In the middle rode the chief on a big handsome mule, his staff of officers all dressed in their finest holiday attire. The wings consisted of soldiers armed to the teeth with gun, sword, and lance. The great man, Kamba Bombo, pulled up in front of our tent. After removing a red Spanish cloak and hood, he stood forth arrayed in a suit of yellow silk with wide arms and a little blue Chinese school cap. His feet were encased in Mongolian boots of green velvet. He was magnificent. "'You will not go another step towards Lhasa,' he said. "'If you do, you will lose your heads. "'It doesn't the least matter who you are or where you come from. "'You must go back to your headquarters.' So an escort was provided, and sorrowfully Sven Hedin turned his back to the jealously guarded town he had striven so hard to reach. The expedition, or rather mission, under Colonel Young Husband, in 1904, brings to an end our history of the exploration of Tibet. He made his way to Lhasa from India. He stood in the sacred city, and except for the Potala, he found it a sorry affair. He succeeded in getting a trade treaty signed, and he rode hastily back to India, and travelled thence to England. The importance of the mission was accentuated by the fact that the flag, a Union Jack bearing the motto, Heaven's Light Our Guide, carried by the expedition, and placed on the table when the treaty was signed in Lhasa, hangs today in the central hall at Windsor, over the statue of Queen Victoria. The veil so long drawn over the capital of Tibet had been at last torn aside, and the naked city had been revealed in all its weird barbarity. Plans of the scattered and ill-regulated city are now familiar. The Potala has been photographed, the Grand Lama has been drawn, and if with the departure of young husband the gates of Lhasa were once more closed, voices from beyond the snowy Himalayas must be heard again ere long. End of chapter 70「Chapter seventy one of Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. V. Singh. Chapter seventy one. Nansen Reaches Farthest North. No names are better known in the history of Arctic exploration than those of Nansen and the Fram, and although others have done work just as fine, the name of Nansen cannot be omitted from our book of discovery. Sven Hedin had not long returned from his great travels through eastern Turkestan and Tibet, when Nansen was preparing for his great journey northwards. He had already crossed Greenland from east to west, a brilliant achievement only excelled by Peary, who a few years later crossed it at higher latitude and proved it to be an island. Now the movement of ice drift in the Arctic seas was occupying the attention of explorers at this time. A ship, the Jeannette, had been wrecked in 1871 off the coast of Siberia, and three years later the debris of the wreck had been washed up on the southwest coast of Greenland. So it occurred to Nansen that a current must flow across the North Pole from Bering Sea on one side to the Atlantic Ocean on the other. His idea was therefore to build a ship as strong as possible to enable it to withstand the pressure of the ice, to allow it to be become frozen in, and then to drift as the articles from the Jeannette had drifted. He reckoned that it would take three years for the drift of ice to carry him to the North Pole. Foolhardy and impossible as the scheme seemed to some, King Oscar came forward with one thousand pounds toward expenses. The Fram was then designed. The whole success of the expedition lay in her strength, 
to withstand the pressure of the ice. At last she was ready, even fitted with electric light. A library, scientifically prepared food, and instruments of the most modern type were on board. The members of the expedition numbered thirteen, and on Midsummer Day, 1893, in calm summer weather, while the setting sun shed his beams over the land, the Fram stood out towards the blue sea, to get its first roll in the long, heaving swell. Along the coast of Norway, past Bergen, past Trondheim, past Tromsø, they steamed, until in a northwesterly gale and driving snow they lost sight of land. It was 25th of July when they sighted Nova Zemlya, plunged in a world of fog. They landed at Khabarova and visited the little old church, seen fifteen years before by Nordenskjold, anxiously inquiring about the state of the ice in the Kara Sea. Here, amid the greatest noise and confusion, some thirty-four dogs were brought on board for the sledges. On 5th August, the explorers successfully passed through the Yugor Strait into the Kara Sea, which was fairly free from ice, and five weeks later sailed past Cape Chelyuskin, the northernmost point of the Old World. The land was low and desolate, says Nansen. The sun had long since gone down behind the sea. Only one star was to be seen. It stood straight above Cape Chelyuskin, shining clearly and sadly in the pale sky. Exactly at four o'clock our flags were hoisted, and our last three cartridges sent out a thundering salute over the sea. The Fram was then turned north to the west of the New Siberian Islands. It was a strange thing to be sailing away north, says Nansen, to unknown lands over an open rolling sea, where no ship had been before. On to the north, steadily north, with a good wind, as fast as steam and sail can take us through unknown regions. They had almost reached seventy-eight degrees north, when they saw ice shining through the fog, and a few days later the Fram was frozen in. Autumn was well advanced, the long night of winter was approaching. There was nothing to be done except prepare ourselves for it, and we converted our ship, as well as we could, into comfortable winter quarters. By October the ice was pressing round the Fram with a noise like thunder. It is piling itself up into long walls and heaps, high enough to reach a good way up the Fram's rigging. In fact, it is trying its very utmost to grind the Fram into powder. Christmas came and went. The new year of 1894 dawned, with a thermometer 36 degrees below zero. By February, the Fram had drifted to the 18th degree of latitude. High festival in order of the 18th degree, writes Nansen. Hurrah! Well sailed! The wind is whistling among the hummocks, the snow flies rustling through the air, ice and sky are melted into one, but we are going north at full speed, and are in the wildest of gay spirits. If we go on at this rate, we shall be at the pole in fifty months. On 17th of May, the 81st degree of latitude is reached. Five months have passed away. By 31st of October, they had drifted to the 82nd. A grand banquet today, says Nansen, to celebrate the 82nd degree of latitude. We are progressing merrily towards our goal. We are already halfway between the New Siberian Islands and Franz Josef Land, and there is not a soul on board who doubts that we shall accomplish what we came to do. So long live merriment. Now Nansen planned the great sledge journey, which has been called the most daring ever undertaken. The winter was passed in peaceful preparation for a start in the spring. When the new year of 1895 dawned, the Fram had been firmly frozen in for fifteen months. A few days later, the ship was nearly crushed by a fresh ice pressure, and all prepared to abandon her, if necessary. But after an anxious day of ice roaring and crackling, a nice pressure with a vengeance, as if doomsday had come, remarked Nansen, it quieted down. They had now beaten all records, for they had reached eighty-three degrees latitude. And now preparations for the great sledge journey were complete. 
They had built kayaks or light boats to sail in open water, and these were placed on the sledges and drawn by dogs. Nansen decided only to take one companion, Johansen, and to leave the others with the Fram. At last the great day had arrived. The chief aim of the expedition is to push through the unknown polar sea from the region around the New Siberian Islands, north of Franz Josef Land, and onward to the Atlantic Ocean near Spitsbergen or Greenland. Farewells were said, and then the two men bravely started off over the unknown desert sea with their sledges and twenty-eight dogs. For the first week they travelled well and soon reached eighty-five degrees latitude. The only disagreeable thing to face now is the cold, says Nansen. Our clothes are transformed more and more into complete suits of ice armor. The sleeve of my coat actually rubbed deep sores in my wrists, one of which got frostbitten. The wound grew deeper and deeper and nearly reached the bone. At night we packed ourselves into our sleeping bags and lay with our teeth chattering for an hour before we became aware of a little warmth in our bodies. Steadily, with faces to the north, they pressed on over the blocks of rough ice, stretching as far as the horizon, till on 8th of April further progress became impossible. Nansen strode on ahead and mounted one of the highest hummocks to look around. He saw a veritable chaos of ice blocks, ridge after ridge, and nothing but rubble to travel over. He therefore determined to turn and make for Franz Josef land, some four hundred and fifty miles distant. They had already reached eighty-six degrees of latitude, farther north than any expedition had reached before. As they travelled south, they rejoiced in the warmth of the sun, but their food was growing scarce, and they had to kill a dog every other day to feed the others, till by May they had only thirteen dogs left. June found them having experienced tremendous snowstorms with only seven dogs left. Although they were in the latitude of Franz Josef land, no welcome shores appeared. It was now three months since they had left the Fram. The food for the dogs was quite finished, and the poor creatures were beginning to eat their harness of sailcloth. Mercifully, before the months ended, they managed to shoot a seal, which provided them with food for a month. It's a pleasing change, says Nansen, to be able to eat as much and as often as we like. Blubber is excellent, both raw and fried. For dinner I fried a highly successful steak. For supper I made blood pancakes fried in blubber with sugar, unsurpassed in flavor. And here we lie up in the far north, two grim, black, soot-stained barbarians, stirring a mess of soup in a kettle, surrounded on all sides by ice, ice covered with impassable snow. A bear and two cubs were shot, and the explorers stayed on at Longing Camp, as they named this dreary spot, unable to go on, but amply fed. On 24th of July we get the first cheerful entry for many a long day. Land, land, after nearly two years we again see something rising above that never-ending white line of the horizon yonder. A new life is beginning for us. Only two dogs were now left to drag the sledges, so the two explorers were obliged to help with the dragging. For thirteen days they proceeded in the direction of land, dragging and pushing their burdens over the ridges of ice with thawing snow. At last on 7th of August they stood at the edge of the ice. Behind lies the troubles. Before was the waterway home. Then they launched their little kayaks, which danced over the open waters, the little waves splashing against their sides. When the mist cleared, they found themselves on the west coast of Franz Josef Land, discovered by an Austro-Hungarian expedition in 1874. They were full of hope, when a cruel disappointment damped their joy. They had landed and were camping on the shore, when a great storm arose, and the wind blew the drift ice down, till it lay packed along the coast. The little ships were frozen in, and there was no hope of reaching home that winter. Here they were doomed to stay. Fortunately there were bears and walrus, so they could not starve, and with a magnificent pluck they set to work to prepare for the winter. 
For many a long day they toiled, at the necessary task of skinning and cutting up walrus, till they were saturated with the blood. But soon they had two great heaps of blubber and meat on shore, well covered over with walrus hides. September was occupied in building a hut amid the frost and snow, with walrus hides and tusks, warmed inside with train oil lamps. Here, under bare skins, they slept, and passed the long months of winter. In October the sun disappeared, the days grew darker. Life grew very monotonous, for it was the third polar winter the explorers had been called on to spend. They celebrated Christmas Day, Nansen by washing himself in the quarter of a cup of a warm water, Johansen by turning his shirt. The weather outside was stormy and almost took their breath away with its icy coldness. They longed for a book, but they whiled away the hours by trying to calculate how far the Fram could have drifted, and when she was likely to reach home. They were distressed at the dirt of their clothes, and longed to be able to throw away the heavy oily rags that seemed glued to their bodies. They had no soap, and water had no effect on the horrible grease. It was May before the weather allowed them to leave the hut at last. Hopefully they dragged their kayaks over the snow, the sledge-runners fastened on to their feet, and so made their way southwards, down Franz Josef land. Once Nansen was very nearly drowned, the explorers had reached the south of the islands, and having moored their little boats together, they ascended a hummock close by. When to their horror, they saw the kayaks were adrift. Nansen rushed down, threw off some clothes, and sprang into the water after them. He was none too soon, for already the boats were drifting rapidly away. The water was icy cold, but it was a case of life or death. Without the boats they were lost men. All we possessed was on board, says Nansen, so I exerted myself to the utmost. I redoubled my exertions, though I felt my limbs gradually stiffening. At last I was able to stretch out my hand to the edge of the kayak. I tried to pull myself up, but the whole of my body was stiff with cold. After a time I managed to swing one leg up onto the edge and to tumble up. Nor was it easy to paddle in the double vessel. The gust of wind seemed to go right through me as I stood there in my wet woolen shirt. I shivered, my teeth chattered, and I was numb all over. At last I managed to reach the edge of the ice. I shook and trembled all over, while well, Johansen pulled off the wet things and packed me into a sleeping bag. The critical situation was saved. And now came one of those rare historic days in the history of exploration. It was 17th June, 1896. Nansen was surveying the lonely line of coast, when suddenly the barking of a dog fell on his ear, and soon in front he saw the fresh tracks of some animal. It was with a strange mixture of feelings, he says, that I made my way among the numerous hummocks towards land. Suddenly I thought I heard a human voice, the first for three years. How my heart beat and the blood rushed to my brain as I hallooed, with all the strength of my lungs. Soon I heard another shout, and saw a dark form moving among the hummocks. It was a man. We approached one another quickly. I waved my hat. He did the same. As I drew near, I thought I recognized Mr. Jackson, whom I remembered once to have seen. I raised my hat. We extended a hand to one another with a hearty, How do you do? Above us a roof of mist, beneath our feet is the rugged-packed drift ice. Aren't you Nansen? he said. Yes, I am, was the answer. And seizing the grimy hand of the Arctic explorer, he shook it warmly, congratulating him on his successful trip. Jackson and his companions had wintered at Cape Flora, the southern point of Franz Josef Land, and they were expecting a ship, the Windward, to take them home. On 26 July, the Windward steamed slowly in, and by 13th of August she reached Norway, and the news of Nansen's safe arrival was made known to the whole world. A week later the little Fram, strong and broad and weather-beaten, also returned in safety. And on 9th of September, 1896, Nansen and his brave companions on board the Fram sailed up Christiania Fjord in triumph. 
he had reached a point farthest north and been nearer to the North Pole than had any explorer before. End of chapter 71「Chapter seventy two of a book of discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A book of discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter seventy two. Peary reaches the North Pole. Nineteen o nine. The sixth April, nineteen o nine, is a marked day in the annals of exploration. For on that day Peary succeeded in reaching the North Pole, which for centuries had defied the efforts of man. On that day he attained the goal for which the greatest nations of the world had struggled for over four hundred years. Indeed, he had spent twenty-three years of his own life laboring towards this end. He was mainly inspired by reading Nordeskjold's Exploration of Greenland when a lieutenant in the United States Navy in 1886 he got leave to join an expedition to Greenland and returned with the Arctic fever in his veins and a scheme for crossing that continent as far north as possible. This, after many hardships, he accomplished, being the first explorer to discover that Greenland was an island. Peary was now stamped as a successful Arctic explorer. The idea of reaching the North Pole began to take shape and in order to raise funds, the enthusiastic explorer delivered no less than 168 lectures in 96 days. With the proceeds, he chartered the Falcon and left the shores of Philadelphia in June 1893 for Greenland. His wife, who accompanied him before, accompanied him again, and with sledges and dogs on board, they made their way up the western coast of Greenland. Arrived at Melville Bay, Peary built a little hut. Here a little daughter was born, who was soon bundled in soft warm arctic furs and wrapped in the stars and stripes. No European child had ever been born so far north as this. The Eskimos traveled for long distances to satisfy themselves she was not made of snow, and for the first six months of her life the baby lived in continuous lamplight. But we cannot follow Peary through his many polar expeditions. His toes had been frozen off in one, his leg broken in another, but he was enthusiastic enough when all preparations were complete for the last and greatest expedition of all. The Roosevelt, named after the President of the United States, had carried him safely to the north of Greenland in his last expedition, so she was a contusion and in July 1908 Peary hoisted the stars and stripes and steamed from New York. As the ship backed out into the river, a cheer went up from the thousands who had gathered on the piers to see us off. It was an interesting coincidence that the day on which we started for the coldest spot on earth was about the hottest which New York had known for years. As we steamed up the river, the din grew louder and louder, we passed President Roosevelt's naval yacht, the Mayflower, and her small gun roared out in parting salute. Surely no ship ever started for the ends of the earth with more heart-stirring farewells. President Roosevelt had himself inspected the ship and shaken hands with each member of the expedition. I believe in you, Perry, he had said, and I believe in your success, if it is within the possibility of man. So the little Roosevelt steamed away. On 26 July, the Arctic Circle was crossed by Peary for the twentieth time, and on 1st of August, Cape York, the most northerly home of human beings in the world, was reached. This was the dividing line between the civilized world on one hand and the Arctic world on the other. Picking up several Eskimo families and about 250 dogs, they steamed on northwards. Imagine, says Peary, imagine about 350 miles of almost solid ice, ice of all shapes and sizes, mountains ice, flat ice, racked and tortured ice. Then imagine a little black ship, solid, sturdy, compact, strong and resistant, 
and on this little ship are sixty-nine human beings, who have gone out into the crazy, ice-tortured channel between Baffin Bay and the Polar Sea, gone out to prove the reality of a dream, in the pursuit of which men have frozen and starved and died. The usual course was taken, across Smith Sound, and past the desolate wine-swept rocks of Cape Sabine, where, in 1884, Greeley's ill-fated party slowly starved to death, only seven surviving out of twenty-four. Fog and ice now beset the ship, and on 5th September they were compelled to seek winter quarters, for which they chose Cape Sheridan, where Peary had wintered before in 1905. Here they unloaded the Roosevelt, and 246 Eskimo dogs were at once let loose to run about in the snow. A little village soon grew up, and the Eskimos, both men and women, went hunting as of yore. Peary had decided to start as before from Cape Columbia, some ninety miles away, the most northerly point of Grant Land, for his dash to the Pole. On 12th October the sun disappeared, and they entered cheerfully into the great dark. Imagine us in our winter home, says Peary, four hundred and fifty miles from the North Pole, the ship held tight in her icy berth, one hundred and fifty yards from the shore, ship and the surrounding world covered with snow, the wind creaking in the rigging, whistling and shrieking around the corners of the deck houses, the temperature ranging from zero to sixty below, the ice pack in the channel outside as groaning and complaining with the movement of the tides. Christmas passed with its usual festivities. There were races for the Eskimos, one for the children, one for the men, and one for the Eskimo mothers, who carried babies in their fur hoods. These last, looking like animated walruses, took their race at a walking pace. At last, on 15th February, 1909, the first sledge party left the ship for Cape Columbia, and a week later Peary himself left the Roosevelt with last loads. The party assembled at Cape Columbia for the great journey north, which consisted of seven men of Peary's party, fifty-nine Eskimos, one hundred and forty dogs, and twenty-eight sledges. Each sledge was complete in itself. Each had its cooking utensils, its four men, its dogs and provisions for fifty or sixty days. The weather was clear, calm, and cold. On 1st of March, the cavalcade started off from Cape Columbia in a freezing east wind, and soon men and dogs became invisible amid drifting snow. Day by day they went forward, undaunted by the difficulties and hardships of the way, now sending back small parties to the depot at Cape Columbia, now dispatching to the home camp some reluctant explorer with a frostbitten heel or foot, now delayed by open water, but on, on, till they had broken all records, passed all tracks even of the polar bear, passed the 87th parallel into the region of perpetual daylight for half the year. It was here, apparently, within reach of his goal, that Peary had to turn back three years before for want of food. Thus they marched for a month. Party after party had been sent back, till the last supporting party had gone, and Peary was left with his black servant, Henson, and four Eskimos. He had five sledges, forty picked dogs, and supplies for forty days when he started off alone to dash the last hundred and thirty-three miles to the pole itself. Every event in the next week is of thrilling interest. After a few hours of sleep, the little party started off shortly after midnight on 2nd of April, 1909. Peary was leading. I felt the keenest exhilaration as I climbed over the ridge and breasted the keen air sweeping over the mighty ice, pure and straight from the pole itself. They might yet be stopped by open water from reaching the goal. On they went, twenty-five miles in ten hours, then a little sleep and so on again, then a few hours rest and another twenty miles, till they had reached latitude eighty-nine degrees. Still breathlessly they hurried forward, till on the fifth they were but thirty-five miles from the pole. The sky overhead was a colorless pole, gradually deepening to almost black at the horizon, 
and the ice was a ghastly and chalky white. On 6 April the pole was reached. The pole at last, writes Peary in his diary, the prize of three centuries, my dream and goal for twenty years, mine at last. I cannot bring myself to realize it. It all seems so simple and commonplace. Flags were coisted at once, on ice lances, and the successful explorer watched them proudly, waving in the bright Arctic sunlight at the pole. Through all his perilous expeditions to the Arctic regions, Pierre had worn a silken flag, worked by his wife, wrapped round his body. He now flew it on this historic spot, which knows no north, nor west, nor east. Not a vestige of land was to be seen, nothing but ice lay all around. They could not stay long, for provisions would run short, and the ice might melt before their return journey was accomplished. So after a brief rest, they started off for Cape Columbia, which they reached after a wild rush of sixteen days. It had taken them thirty-seven days to cover the four hundred and seventy-five miles from Cape Columbia to the Pole, from which they had returned at the rate of thirty miles a day. The whole party then started for the Roosevelt, and on 18th July she was taken from her winter quarters and turned towards home. Then came the day when wireless telegraphy flashed the news through the whole of the civilized world, stars and stripes nailed to the North Pole. The record of four hundred years of splendid self-sacrifice and heroism, unrivaled in the history of exploration, had been crowned at last. End of chapter 72「It was a Norwegian who succeeded in reaching the South Pole in 1911. But the spade work which contributed so largely to the final success had been done so enthusiastically by two Englishmen that the expeditions of Scott and Shackleton must find a place here before we conclude this book of discovery with Amundsen's final and brilliant dash. The crossing of the Antarctic Circle by the famous Challenger expedition in 1874 revived interest in the far south. The practical outcome of much discussion was the design of the discovery, a ship built expressly for scientific exploration, and the appointment of Captain Scott to command an Antarctic expedition. In August 1901, Scott left the shores of England, and by way of New Zealand, crossed the Antarctic Circle on 3rd of January 1902. Three weeks later he reached the great ice barrier, which had stopped Ross in 1840. For a week Scott steamed along the barrier. Mounts Erebus and Terror were plainly visible, and though he could nowhere discover Perry Mountains, yet he found distant land rising high above the sea, which he named King Edward the Seventh Land. Scott had brought with him a captive balloon, in which he now rose to a height of 800 feet, from which he saw an unbroken glacier stream of vast extent stretching to the south. It was now time to seek for winter quarters, and Scott, returning to M. Murdo Bay, named by Ross, found that it was not a bay at all, but a strait leading southward. Here they landed their stores, set up their hut, and spent the winter, till on 2nd of November 1902 all was ready for a sledge journey to the south. For fifty-nine days Scott led his little land party of three, with four sledges and nineteen dogs, south. But the heavy snow was too much for the dogs, and one by one died, until not one was left, and the men had to drag and push the sledges themselves. Failing provisions at last compelled them to stop. Great mountain summits were seen beyond the farthest point reached. We have decided at last, we have found something which is fitting to bear the name of him 
whom we most delight to honor, says Scott, and Mount Markham it shall be called in memory of the father of the expedition. It was 30th December when a tremendous blizzard stayed their last advance. Chill and hungry, they lay all day in their sleeping bags, miserable at the thought of turning back, too weak and ill to go on. With only provisions for a fortnight, they at last reluctantly turned home, staggering as far as their depot in thirteen days. Shackleton was smitten with scurvy, he was growing worse every day, and it was a relief when on 2nd February they all reached the ship, alive, as near spent as three persons can well be. But they had done well, they had made the first long land journey ever made in the Antarctic. They had reached a point which was farthest south. They had tested new methods of travel. They had covered 960 miles in 93 days. Shackleton was now invalided home, but it was not till 1904 that the discovery escaped from the frozen harbor to make her way home. Shackleton had returned to England in 1903, but the mysterious South Pole, amid its wastes of ice and snow, still called him back and, in command of the Nimrod, he started forth in August 1907 on the next British Antarctic expedition, carrying a Union Jack, presented by the Queen, to plant on the spot farthest south. He actually placed it within 97 miles of the pole itself. With a petrol motor car on board, Eskimo dogs and Manjurian ponies, he left New Zealand on 1st January 1908, watched and cheered by some thirty thousand of his fellow countrymen. Three weeks later they were in sight of the great ice barrier, and a few days later the huge mountains of Erebus and Terror came into sight. Shackleton had hoped to reach King Edward the Seventh's land for in winter quarters, but a formidable ice pack prevented this, and they selected a place some twenty miles north of the Discovery's old winter quarters. Getting the wild little Manjurian ponies ashore was no light job. The poor little creatures were stiff after a month's constant buffeting, for the Nimrod's passage had been stormy. One after another they were now led out of their stalls into a horse box and slung over the ice. Once on terra firma they seemed more at home, for they immediately began pawing the snow as they were wont to do in their far away Manjurian home. The spacious hut, brought out by Shackleton, was soon erected. Never was such a luxurious house set up on the bleak shores of the polar seas. There was a dark room for developing, acetylene gas for lighting, a good stove for warming, and comfortable cubicles decorated with pictures. The dark room was excellent, and never was a book of travels more beautifully illustrated than Shackleton's Heart of the Antarctic. True, during some of the winter storms and blizzards, the hut shook and trembled, so that every moment its occupants thought it would be carried bodily away, but it stood its ground all right. The long winter was spent as usual, in preparing for the spring expedition to the south, but it was 29th of October, 1908, before the weather made it possible to make a start. The party consisted of Shackleton, Adams, Marshall, and Wilde, each leading a pony which dragged a sledge with food for ninety-one days. A glorious day for our start, wrote Shackleton in his diary. Brilliant sunshine and a cloudless sky. As we left the hut, where we had spent so many months in comfort, we had a feeling of real regret that never again would we all be together there. A clasp of the hands means more than many words, and as we turned to acknowledge the men's cheer, and saw them standing on the ice by the familiar cliffs, I felt we must try to do well for the sake of everyone concerned in the expedition. New land in the shape of ice-clad mountains greeted the explorers on 22nd November. It is a wonderful place we are in, all new to the world, says Shackleton. There is an impression of limitless solitude about it that makes us feel so small as we trudge along a few dark specks on the snowy plain. The Noh had to quit the barrier in order to travel south. Fortunately, they found a gap called the Southern Gateway, which afforded a direct line to the pole. 
but their ponies had suffered badly during the march. They had already been obliged to shoot three of them, and on 7th December the last pony fell down a crevasse and was killed. They had now reached a great plateau some 7,000 feet above the sea. It rose steadily toward the south, and Christmas Day found them lying in a little tent, isolated high on the roof of the world, far from the way trodden by man. With forty-eight degrees of frost, drifting snow, and a biting wind, they spent the next few days hauling their sledges up a steep incline. They had now only a month's food left. Pressing on with reduced rations, in the face of freezing winds, they reached a height of ten thousand and fifty feet. It was the sixth of January, and they were in latitude eighty-eight degrees, when a blinding, shrieking blizzard made all further advance impossible. For sixty hours the four hungry explorers lay in their sleeping bags, nearly perished with cold. The most trying day we have yet spent, writes Shackleton, our fingers and faces being continually frostbitten. Tomorrow we will rush south with the flag. It is our last outward march. The gale breaking, they marched on till ninth of January, when they stopped within ninety-seven miles of the Pole, where they hoisted the Junior Jack, and took possession of the great plateau in the king's name. We could see nothing but the dead white snow plain. There was no break in the plateau as it extended towards the pole. I am confident that the pole lies on the great plateau we have discovered, miles and miles from any outstanding land. And so the four men turned homewards. Whatever our regret may be, we have done our best, said the leader somewhat sadly. Blinding blizzards followed them as they made their way slowly back. On 28th of January they reached the great ice barrier. Their food was well nigh spent. Their daily rations consisted of six biscuits and some horse meat, in the shape of the Manjurian ponies they had shot and left the November before. But it disagreed with most of them, and it was four very weak and ailing men who staggered back to the Nimrod towards the end of February 1909. Shackleton reached England in the autumn of 1909 to find that another Antarctic expedition was to leave our shores in the following summer under the command of Scott in the Terra Nova. It was one of the best equipped expeditions that ever started. Motor sledges had been specially constructed to go over the deep snow, which was fatal to the motor car carried by Shackleton. There were fifteen ponies and thirty dogs, Leaving England in July 1910, Scott was established in winter quarters in M. Murdo Sound by 26 January 1911. It was November before he could start on the southern expedition. We left Hut Point on the evening of 2nd November. For 60 miles we followed the track of the motors, sent on five days before. The ponies are going very steadily. We found the motor party awaiting us in latitude eighty and a half degrees south. The motors had proved entirely satisfactory, and the machines dragged heavy loads over the worst part of the barrier surface, crossing several crevices. The sole cause of abandonment was the overheating of the air-cooled engines. We are building snow cairns at intervals of four miles to guide homeward parties, and leaving a week's provisions at every degree of latitude. As we proceeded, the weather grew worse, and snowstorms were frequent. The sky was continually overcast, and the land was rarely visible. The ponies, however, continued to pull splendidly. As they proceeded south, they encountered terrific storms of wind and snow, out of which they had constantly to dig the ponies. Christmas passed, and the new year of 1912 dawned. On 3rd of January, when 150 miles from the Pole, I am going forward, says Scott, with a party of five men with a month's provisions, and the prospect of success seems good, provided that the weather holds and no unforeseen obstacles arise. Scott and his companions successfully attained the object of their journey. They reached the South Pole on 17th January, only to find that they had been forestalled by others and it is remarkable to note that so correct were their observations that two parties located the pole within a half a mile of one another. 
Scott's return journey ended disastrously. Blinding blizzards prevented rapid progress. Food and fuel ran short. Till the weakened men struggled bravely forward. Till, within a few miles of a depot of supplies, death overtook them. Scott's last message can never be forgotten. I do not regret this journey, which has shown that Englishmen can endure hardship, help one another, and meet death with as great fortitude as ever in the past. Had we lived, I should have had a tale to tell of the hardihood, endurance, and courage of my companions, which would have stirred the heart of every Englishman. These rough notes and our dead bodies must tell the tale. But surely, surely, a great rich country like ours will see that those who are dependent upon us are properly provided for. It was on 14th December, 1911, that Captain Amundsen had reached the Pole. A Norwegian, fired by the example of his fellow countryman, Nansen, Amundsen had long been interested in both Arctic and Antarctic exploration. In a ship of only 48 tons, he had, with six others, made a survey of the North Magnetic Pole, sailed through the Bering Strait, and accomplished the Northwest Passage, for which he was awarded the Royal Medal of the Royal Geographical Society. On his return he planned an expedition to the North Pole. He had made known his scheme, and duly equipped for North Polar Expedition in Nansen's little fram, a month started. Suddenly the world rang with the news that Peary had discovered the North Pole, and that Amundsen had turned his prow southwards, and was determined to make a dash for the South Pole. Landing in Wales Bay, some four hundred miles to the east of Scott's winter quarters, his first visitors were the Englishmen on board the Terra Nova, who were taking their ship to New Zealand for the winter. Making a hut on the shore, Amundsen had actually started on his journey to the Pole before Scott heard of his arrival. I am fully alive to the complication in the situation arising out of Amundsen's presence in the Antarctic, wrote the English explorer. But as any attempt at a race might have been fatal to our chance of getting to the Pole at all, I decided to do exactly as I should have done had not Amundsen been here. If he gets to the Pole, he will be bound to do it rapidly with dogs, and one foresees that success will justify him. Although the Norwegian explorer left his winter quarters on 8th of September for his dash to the Pole, he started too early. Three of his party had their feet frostbitten, and the dogs suffered severely, so he turned back, and it was not till 20th of October, just a week before Scott's start, that he began in real earnest his historic journey. He was well off for food, for whales were plentiful on the shores of the bay, and seals, penguins, and gulls abounded. The expedition was well equipped, with eight explorers, four sledges, and thirteen dogs attached to each. Amundsen is a splendid leader, supreme in organization, and the essential in Antarctic travel is to think out the difficulties before they arise. So said those who worked with him on his most successful journey. Through dense fog and blinding blizzards, the Norwegians now made their way south, their Norwegian skis and sledges proving a substantial help. The crevices in the ice were very bad. One dog dropped in and had to be abandoned. Another day the dogs got across, but the sledge fell in, and it was necessary to climb down the crevice, unpack the sledge, and pull up piece by piece, till it was possible to raise the empty sledge. So intense was the cold that the very brandy froze in the bottle and was served out in lumps. It did not taste much like brandy then, said the man, but it burnt our throats as we sucked it. The dogs traveled well. Each man was responsible for his own team. He fed them and made them fond of him. Thus all through November the Norwegians traveled south, till they reached the vast plateau described by Shackleton. One tremendous peak, 15,000 feet high, they named Fridtjof Nansen. On 14th of December they reached their goal. The weather was beautiful, the ground perfect for sledging. At 3 p.m. we made halt, says Amundsen. According to our reckoning, we had reached our destination. All of us gathered round the colors, a beautiful silken flag, 
all hands took hold of it, and planting it on the spot, we gave the vast plateau on which the pole is situate the name of the King Hakon the Seven. It was a vast plain, alike in all directions, mile after mile. Here, in brilliant sunshine, the little party camped, taking observations, till 17th December, when fastening to the ground a little tent with the Norwegian flag and the Fram pennant, they gave it the name Polheim, and started for home. So the North and South Poles yielded up their well-hoarded secrets, after centuries of waiting, within two and a half years of one another. They had claimed more lives than any exploration had done before, or is ever likely to do again. And so ends the last of these great earth stories, stories which have made the world what it is today, and we may well say was one of the most successful explorers of our times. The future may give us thrilling stories of the conquest of the air, but the spirit of man has mastered the earth. End of chapter 73「Chapter 74 of A Book of Discovery」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 74 Dates of Chief Events The Oldest Known Ships 6000 to 5000 B.C. Expedition to Punt, 1600 B.C. Phoenician Expeditions, 700 B.C. Neko's Fleet Built, 613 B.C. Anaximander the Greek Invents Maps, 580 B.C. Hecateus Writes the First Geography, 500 B.C. Herodotus Describes Egypt, 446 B.C. Hanno sails down west coast of Africa, 450 B.C. Xenophon crosses Asia Minor, 401 B.C. Alexander the Great finds India, 327 B.C. Nearchus navigates the Indian Ocean, 326 B.C. The Geography of Eratosthenes, 240-196 B.C. Pythias discovers the British Isles and Thule, 333 B.C. Julius Caesar explores France, Britain, Germany, 60 to 54 B.C. Strabo's Geography, 18 Anno Domini. Agricola discovers the Highlands, 83 Anno Domini. Pliny's Geography, 170. Ptolemy's Geography of Maps, 159. The First Guide for Travelers, 4th Century. St. Patrick Explores Ireland, 432-493. to St. Columba Reaches the Orkney Isles, 563. St. Brandon Crosses the Atlantic, 6th Century. Willibald Travels from Britain to Jerusalem, 721. The Christian Topography of Cosmos, 6th Century. Nadod the Viking Discovers Iceland, 861. Eric the Red discovers Greenland, 985. Leif discovers Newfoundland and North America, 1000. Ozir navigates the Baltic Sea, 890. Mohammedan travelers to China, 831. Idris's geography, 1154. Benjamin of Tudela visits India and China, 1160. Carpini visits the Great Khan, 1246. William de Rubruquis also visits the Great Khan, 1255. Mafflio and Niccolo Polo reach China, 1260 to 1271. Marco Polo's travels, 1271 to 1295. Ibn Battuta's travels through Asia, 1324-1348. Sir John Mandeville's Travels Published, 1372. Hereford Mundi appeared, 1218. Anglo-Saxon Map of the World, 990. 
Prince Henry of Portugal encouraged exploration, 1418. Zarco and Vaz reach Porto Santo, 1419. Zarco discovers Madeira, 1420. Nuno Tristram discovers Cape Blanco, 1441. Gonzalves discovers Cape Verde Islands, 1442. Cadamosto reaches the Senegal River and Cape Verde, 1455. Diego Gomez reaches the Gambia River, 1458. Death of Prince Henry, 1460. Fra Mauro's Map, 1457. Diego Cam discovers the Congo, 1484. Bartholomew Diaz rounds the Cape of Good Hope, 1486. Martin Behem makes his globe, 1492. Christopher Columbus discovers West Indies, 1492. Columbus finds Jamaica and other islands, 1493. Columbus finds Trinidad, 1498. Death of Columbus, 1504. Amerigo Vespucci finds Trinidad and Venezuela, 1499. First Map of the New World, by Joan de la Corsa, 1500. Vasco da Gama reaches India by the Cape, 1497. Pietro Cabral discovers Brazil, 1500. Francisco Serrano reaches the Spice Islands, 1511. Balboa sees the Pacific Ocean, 1513. The first circumnavigation of the world, 1519 to 1522. Cordova discovers Yucatan, 1517. Juan Grijalva discovers Mexico, 1518. Cortes conquers Mexico, 1519. Pizarro conquers Peru, 1531. Orclano discovers the Amazon, 1541. Cabot sails to Newfoundland, 1497. Jacques Cartier discovers the Gulf of St. Lawrence, 1534. Sir Hugh Willoughby finds Nova Zembla, 1553. Richard Kanzler reaches Moscow via Archangel, 1554. Anthony Jenkinson crosses Russia to Bukhara. 1558. Pinto claims the discovery of Japan. 1542. Martin Frobisher discovers his bay. 1576. Drake sails round the world. 1577-1580. Davis finds his strait. 1586. Barons discovers Spitsbergen. 1596. Hudson sails into his bay. 1610. Buffin discovers his bay, 1616. Sir Walter Raleigh explores Guiana, 1595. Champlain discovers Lake Ontario, 1615. Torres sails through his strait, 1605. Lemaire rounds Cape Horn, 1617. Tasman finds Tasmania, 1642. Dampier discovers his strait, 1698. Bering finds his strait, 1741. Cook discovers New Zealand, 1769. Cook anchors in Botany Bay, Australia, 1770. Cook discovers the Sandwich Islands, 1777. La Perouse makes discoveries in China, 1785 to 1788. Bruce discovers the source of the Blue Nile, 1770. Mungo Park reaches the Niger, 1796. Vancouver explores his island, 1792. Mackenzie discovers his river in British Columbia, 1789 to 1793. Ross discovers Melville Bay, 1818. Perry discovers Lancaster Sound, 1819. Franklin reaches the Polar Sea by land, 1819 to 1822. Perry's discoveries on North American coast, 1822. Franklin navies the Mackenzie River, 1825. Beachy doubles Icy Cape, 1826. Perry attempts the North Pole by Spitsbergen, 1827. Denham and Clapperton discover Lake Chad, 1822. Clapperton reaches the Niger, 1826. René Kehl 
enters Timbuktu, 1829. Richard and John Lander find the mouth of the Niger, 1830. Ross discovers Boothia Felix, 1829. James Ross finds the North Magnetic Pole, 1830. Bass discovers his strait, 1797. Flinders and Bass sail round Tasmania, 1798. Flinders surveys south coast of Australia, 1801 to 1804. Sturt traces the Darling and Murray rivers, 1828 to 1831. Burke and Wills cross Australia, 1861. Ross discovers Victoria Land in the Antarctic, 1840. Franklin discovers the Northwest Passage, 1847. Livingstone crosses Africa from west to east, 1849 to 1856. Burton and Speak discover Lake Tanganyika, 1857. Speak sees Victoria Nyanza, 1858. Livingston finds lakes Sherva and Nyasa, 1858 to 1864. Speak and Grant enter Uganda, 1861. Baker meets Speak and Grant at Gondokoro, 1861. Baker discovers Albert Nyanza, 1864. Livingston finds lakes Meoro and Bangviolo, 1868. Stanley finds Livingstone, 1871. Livingston dies at Ilala, 1873. Stanley finds the mouth of the Congo, 1877. Nordisk Guild solves the Northeast Passage, 1879. Young Husband enters Lhasa, 1904. Nansen reaches farthest north, 1895. Peary reaches the North Pole, 1909. Amundsen reaches the South Pole, 1911. End of chapter 74 And this is also the end of A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Thank you for listening.